And we're Good live. evening. The 21st meeting of the 25th Council will come to order. Uh, I believe all councilors are present this evening via Zoom video conference. Get started with the Pledge of Allegiance in English, uh, led by uh, Councilor Davis, and in Spanish, led by uh, Councilor Bassan does it so well in Spanish. So I'll ask her to do that again. He does. And would you please join us for the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, the United States of America, of America. And, and to the, the republic people. for which it stands, one nation under God, under God. indivisible, mm -hmm. with liberty and justice for all. Puro fidelidad a la bandera de los Estados Unidos de América y a la república que representa una nación bajo Dios, indivisible, con libertad y justicia para todos. Thank you, counselors. Members of the public, city staff, and the media have the ability to view this meeting on live streams through four different platforms, GovTV on Comcast Channel 16, the GovTV website, YouTube, and Zoom webinar. The live streams can be accessed from most smartphones, tablets, or computers. Also, this meeting is closed captioned, and you may enable the closed captioning on your television or device at this time. Video recordings of this and all past council meetings remain available for viewing at any time on the city council's website. If you need assistance with that, uh, please call during uh, working day, working hours, Monday through Friday, 768-3100 for assistance. The council will take a break at approximately seven this evening. Uh, and we want tonight's proceeding to be as civil and respectful as possible. So please do not make any personal attacks and we want to just be respectful to one another and have a smooth meeting. We've got a lengthy agenda tonight. So we're gonna get started with proclamations and presentations starting with Council, Councilor Feeblecorn and then Councilor Bassan. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, tonight I asked um, for a presentation on the Complete Streets Ordinance. This is an ordinance that the council passed um, before I became a member um, that required performance measures, project evaluation, and staff training on complete streets. And there was supposed to be a presentation to council, and I don't think that ever happened. And I'm just trying to get up to speed on how we're doing on this implementation. So um, we have Jennifer Morrow, so Associate Director for the Department of Municipal Development, and Valerie Hermanson, Public Works Strategic Program Manager, here to present tonight. I hope we have them here. They are not on Zoom. You're here in the mayor's conference room, Councilor. Ah, okay. okay. Jenna, our our presentation to have it uploaded. Um, did the, do you guys have a copy of that? We do not. Unfortunately, we did not receive that. It doesn't look like. They can share their screen though. You can share your screen if you'd like. Um, I have a flash drive. Is there some way to plug into a quick flash drive? Always oh, logged in here. Yeah. Is it your computer? No, I am. No. Um, Mr. President, I, I do have the presentation that I could share with Mr. Cornelius if he'd like to drive uh, for the presenters. It would take me, you know, just a minute to get to them. Um, Mr. Cornelius, what's your preference? Would you like me to send that to you, or would you like them to, to get plugged in? Over. Yeah, please okay. send it to me. Thank I'll do you. that now. Thank you. We'll get started as soon as we have that up. Can we stand yeah, on the please. front so they can? Oh, yeah, sure. Mind if I booted you for 10 minutes while we did our presentation? I'm sorry. Thanks. Mr. President, uh, we are still having problems with that document and um, our access to be able to open it. Shanna, uh, Ms. Schultz, if you're able to open it, perhaps you could share your screen. 
Uh, Mr. President, uh, Mr. Melendrez, I am having the same issues as well. I'm sorry. Um, Associate Director Morrow, you, you sent a Microsoft um, share file that requires a login. Are you able to send just the PDF directly? I was unable to send the PDF because, yeah. which, you know. I, I, I'm going to suggest the that we go was, to the... Yeah, the file was too large. I apologize. So I sent it that way. Um, and so I apologize that we're having this problem. Let's uh, let's go to the presentation by APD, and we'll see if we can, uh, in the meantime, get this presentation up where we can see the uh, the slides. So we'll go to uh, Councillor Bassan presentation on APD open space. Thank you, Mr. President. I am uh, wanting to hear from a couple different sides of APD uh, based off of some of the information that I've been able to obtain in the last week or two and regarding the open space unit and its disbandment. So we've asked, uh, I've been in conversation with Councilor Grout as well. And so I know we were talking about wanting to have a couple of different perspectives and we have retired open space officer Anthony Martinez, who had said that he would present to the council uh, and, and to the public regarding kind of the synopsis of what open space does from stuff that he had described to me as something that he put together with the open space unit about what they did. Uh, and they would present it to uh, different scouting groups or different uh, other organizations. No, no, we don't have a laptop connected with each. So I was hoping that we could hear from him and get the presentation uh, that he would give to some of these groups. And then we could hear from uh, Police Chief Medina as well regarding uh, the some of the questions that I had. And I know that Councilor Grout has expressed some, some concern as well. So Mr. Martinez, welcome. And thank you for taking time to share with us. If you are willing to go ahead and give a short presentation, that would be greatly appreciated. Wonderful, and thank you for that. Uh, I, I just wanna thank all of the city council, uh, the chiefs, looks like they're here, the mayor and everybody for allowing me to kind of chat a little bit on the day uh, in the life of an open space officer and kind of what we do, spent 15 years there. So a big part of my life, um, you know, kind of changing things for the better and community policing and such. So if you're good, I could share the screen. Does that sound all right? All right, I got some head nods there. I do talk a lot, so cut me off at any time. And Mr. Martinez, if we can go ahead and keep it to about 10 minutes or less, that would be preferred. For sure, I could definitely. Although some of my colleagues there will probably disagree with me on that. I talk a lot. Are you seeing the screen? Is it blocked a little bit? No, I can't see it on my end. Oh, I think I'm doing it wrong. Hey, give me a second. It's not working. Oh, can you see it? Nope. Not yet. In the meantime, if you want to, or I see Mr. Melendrez, I don't know if there's a different solution. Mr. President, I was only gonna suggest, um, panelists are able to share screen. If Mr. Martinez is having a, some technical troubles with that, he can always email it to us, assuming it's a PDF that we can open um, and we can try to handle it that way. Okay. Garrett, you want to tell me your email address? Absolutely. My email address is G-C-O-R-N-E-L-I-U-S at cabq.gov. Yeah, that's no problem. I mean, you're going to miss a little bit of the pictures and stuff, but I could kind of just go off this if you guys want. It'll probably take a little bit of time. Are you guys good with that? Yeah, I think that's fine. Yeah, we'll yeah. be here quite a bit. So um, anyway, so I'll kind of just kind of start, you know, with, with our mission um, as an open space officer, you know, we are out there to protect, maintain, manage significant natural landscapes and cultural resources for present and future generations to come while we are out there. Um, officers were out there 
making contact with the public, educating them. We're overseeing compliance, um, laws, rules, and regulations while we are out there every single day. Um, it's kind of a dual mission. So their, their mission is to protect the open space lands and the resources and also enjoy, you know, making sure they ensure a safe and enjoyable visit out there while uh, people are using these open space deals. Um, being that, I guess you could call open space is kind of its own little deal, right? If you're a police officer, you, you live in a neighborhood, you see an officer drive through the neighborhood, maybe ride their bike or anything like that to take a call. Well, you know, whether it's up by the mountains, by the river, out in the Mesa, you know, it's a little bit difficult to respond to that call for service, whether it may look like a call for help, maybe it's a domestic violence call, maybe somebody's lost or stuck, whatever it might be. Um, they have to use mountain bikes for mountain bike patrol. Uh, they spend quite a few hours hiking on foot patrol. Uh, they use an airboat, a hovercraft, four by four police units, ATVs, motorcycles. And some of the guys are actually uh, certified um, in the horse, uh, on the horse patrol, I guess, or horse mounted unit. Um, another kind of a deal responsibility for open space officers is search and rescue. Now, I know when you say search and rescue, you're like a police officer, search and rescue, that sounds a little bit funny, um, but that can mean anything. That can mean a child who has wandered away down by the river. It can mean somebody who has having a mental health crisis up on the mountain and may not need just specifically a rescue in general, but they may need a, an officer who's trained in crisis negotiation or anything like that. Um, so that is what we do. We're always available to respond to those um, within the Albuquerque metro area, whether that's, you know, in the city, maybe an elderly person walked away or anywhere out on the trail system. Um, and that include that could include a high angle, a low angle rescue, uh, quite a bit of tracking skills that are involved with that. A lot of the guys are EMT basics. So, you know, sometimes when you call, and you're out in the middle of nowhere, an officer may be the first one to get there. And it's kind of nice that uh, these, these officers, you know, have a little bit of that medical training and kind of help save the day and, and get things going before medical uh, help arrives. Uh, river searches, wilderness backcountry, patrol, um, urban searches, searching for, you know, lost kids, elderly people, and maybe have dementia or something like that. Um, another deal that they do is it's called the dive team. So what happens is if uh, you get a crime, right? Somebody throws a gun in the river or there's evidence, you know, maybe it's Tingley beach or one of these ditches or a golf course pond. These officers are highly trained um, and they can actually go in there and um, look for that evidence or look for that person that might be down there. I think they actually just had a mission not too long ago where the homicide unit actually requested them out and uh, they had to look for some, from stuff uh, in a body of water. Um, so I talked about the evidence search, evidence recovery, and um, God forbid, any type of a body recovery. Um, they are considered a FEMA resource. So the FEMA gives a lot of money, I believe, to um, different entities who can respond to things like natural disasters and stuff. And I know we check a lot of those boxes uh, when it comes to needing uh, a team to get out there to take care of that. Um, officers are responsible for patrolling, patrolling roughly 230,000 acres of remote lands around the metropolitan area. Now, this is actually land that the city owns. It's the city of Albuquerque open space. So this is all, um, if you were to call 911 for whatever reason it is in there, maybe you're lost or you're seeing somebody graffiti something, any, any, type, any type of law enforcement call, these are the officers that respond. Uh, they're prepared to stay out at any given time get the job done. Um, wildland fire pre prevention, whether it's a, a serial arsonist or just being out proactive on patrol with maybe, let's say, a hovercraft, an ATV out on foot and getting eyes on and preventing these fires from actually becoming a huge um, problem and, you know, just destroying, you know, homes and, and land. Uh, game and fish laws, there's people that are out there hunting, um, fishing, different things like that, not doing it correctly. And that's about it on those. Give me a second here. Going through these presentations. I wish you could see the pictures. Um, they assist um, with river and open space land cleanup. So they, you know, they're out there helping with different community events. So open space sponsors cleanup events throughout the year. 
And these officers are hand in hand with the citizens of Albuquerque, the people that uh, pay their taxes, the people that are out there using the areas with their kids, maybe their cross country team is out there running. They're hand in hand helping them uh, pick up uh, any type of trash or anything like that. And just being a good part of the community and enjoying the people that are out there. Uh, they respond to a lot of these remote locations uh, for any type of call for service, like I said, utilizing all of those different types of equipment. Um, a community events. Uh, I can't tell you how many community events I've attended over the past 15 years, but it is absolutely uh, one of the best things that I love to do. I get to see kids. I get to talk about what we do, educate the public on you know, being safe out there and, and how to call 911 or anything that they might see out there. Uh, public education. Uh, we might be out there helping a Boy Scout troop one day uh, learn how to fish and kind of talk to them about the proper laws and things of being a good uh, fisherman out there, um, all the way to, you know, maybe helping somebody who maybe their bicycle wasn't quite right and they're having a hard time out on the trail and we get them in touch with some of the community programs that we have and, and get them a new bike so they can kind of get back and forth to work. Um, and then community policing. Um, these guys are out there every single day. Um, you know, saying hi, giving them food, water, whatever it is, helping people um, better their lives if they're maybe camping out there and they need to kind of find a better place to stay, all those different types of things. So with that, um, you know, together, I think open space, you know, and the public uh, can continue to work together with these officers um, to better our open space lands and definitely keep them beautiful and it, uh, enjoyable and safe uh, for future generations to, to enjoy. So I think that's it for me. Do you guys have any questions? And Mr. President, uh, and once the questions might be done with, with Mr. Martinez, I was hoping that we could do a kind of a flip side of that too and have the chief give a report and update kind of with what the vision is. Plus, I had submitted some questions uh, to the chief when I spoke with him so that I was hoping he would answer those as well. All right. Are there any questions for... Mr. Martinez, thank you so much, Anthony, for, for that rundown. It's good to hear it from, from the horse's mouth, so to speak. It's a small horse. I'm not too small, but I appreciate it. It's, really, it's good to, to kind of give back a little bit, even though I'm retired. So I appreciate you all. Thank you. Thank, thank, thanks for your advocacy. Any questions for, for Anthony? Not seeing any. We'll go ahead and go to uh, <clears throat> Councillor Grau. Sorry, I'm not seeing everyone's raised hand. So I, if, if I miss you, just shout out. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Anthony, I had the opportunity to go out with the APD Open Space Unit yesterday. I, I went on a ride along for five hours with them. And we toured, uh, we just uh, patrolled the Bosque. And I was super impressed with how clean it was. Um, and um, there were a couple of encampments that were abandoned um, and they knew exactly where to go. And I asked how they knew they were there and, and um, they told me they get 311 calls or um, you know somebody will call them and um, they'll head out there. They knew that the um, area just backwards and forwards just got around easily. Um, what could you tell me, what kind of training do these guys um, actually have? Um, how many do, like the, the swim test, could you tell me about that swim test that y'all take? That sounds pretty intense. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I appreciate you uh, actually getting um, getting out there to actually spend some time with them and see what it's all about. That I know that really means a lot to them and, you know, the citizens out there too, to kind of see what they do. Um, and the reason why it would look so clean out there and it was nice is obviously it's uh, proactive, right? These guys are out there every single day. And um, I mean, we all know if you're not being proactive, how things can kind of spiral out of control. So let's get hats off to those guys for sure. But um, as far as the swim test goes, um, you know, people, people kind of just think you could just go out there and patrol the ditch bank or walk along the river or get on a boat and take care of a call. But um it's a little bit more than that. You know, there's a liability involved with being close to the water, you know, whether it's swift water or just the water in general. So that's why we have these uh, requirements and I'm not a very good swimmer. So it would take me quite a bit of time to get past that, but um, just being able to get the call taken care of and come home safe at the end of the day. So it takes a lot of time 
um, a lot of training and that's just the swimming aspect of it. There's so many different um, certifications and training and different things that it just takes to um, enjoy your visit out there like you were in, in the open space. You know, those things aren't just there, you know, and clean for a reason. It's a lot of training, a lot of hours, a lot of time. Thank you. Mr. President, a couple more questions. Um, when you guys are called out to uh, search and rescue, um, typically, are you the first ones on scene? Um, who, you know, in what depart state departments, uh, federal departments um, show up? How does that work? And could you give me um, an example of, of uh, one of your rescues? For sure. Um, you know, it's just, uh, so of course, state police, they are in charge of uh, most of the search and rescues here in the state, um, you know, if they decide to come out and it meets their criteria. Um, but we are, they're all officers that are trained. Um, they can be away from their vehicles for, you know, days. I think the most amount of time I was away from my vehicle was looking for a firefighter who never came home. He went out to go look for a wildland fire. Uh, he went missing and uh, we stayed out for seven days straight looking for this uh, young man to try to bring him back home. Um, but we were available. We were ready to go at any given time. And uh, we were, uh, I think like the chief said, boots on the ground, right? Literally boots on the ground. We're out there patrolling, we're in uniform, we have all this equipment, we have access to um, asking for air support and all these different ent entities. And we can get out there and, and provide you know, help. We get there, we may find them. We know these trails like the back of our hands. We know how to use GPS coordinates. We know how to get there. And it's just really good to know that you know, maybe Maybe you're not a firefighter, or maybe you're not a volunteer search and rescue, but um, when you're cold uh, out on the mountain and you know, you're know you crying, your light's gone out and you don't have a flashlight and it could be pretty scary to know that, I don't know what's gonna happen. And then all of a sudden an officer who was on duty working that day with the skills, training and knowledge to get there to actually uh, turn it into a, a really good outcome and get the rest of the first responders there. Thank you. Um, follow up to that one. Um, when, when you go out to those search and rescues, how long does it take you to get familiar with the areas that you're being called out to? Um, you know, do you, do you guys get lost? Um, how, how did you navigate that area um, and to get familiar with the area? Well, that's an awesome question. And of course we get lost, but we probably don't tell people, we just get redirected a little bit and it might take us a little bit longer to walk there, but, um, it takes years, I'm telling you, years to learn the trail system, the gates, the access points, how to navigate all these different areas that the city owns. Um, and it could be a, an arroyo through the middle of the city. Um, it could be an empty parking lot in the middle of the city. Um, the trails, I'm, I'm talking years. Um, even being on the department for 15 years in the open space unit, I was still finding places that I had never been before. Um, I might've got a call where I was like, wow, I've never taken a call back here. This is something new. You know, like the guys will know I probably took a picture because I enjoy taking pictures, but uh, it's, it takes a long time to learn this stuff. Um, and, and the guys that are there now, it just feels great to know that those guys are still going to be there um, and pass that knowledge on to other officers. Yeah. So. Thank you. And I have one final question um, for you, Mr. Martinez. Um, how often uh, being in the open space division, are you ever called out to help with uh, Foothills Command or Northeast Command? Um, do other departments call you all to help them? Um, yeah, that's another good question. Um, these guys, uh, they're, they're in a marked patrol vehicle. Uh, they have handcuffs, they have a body camera, uh, they can arrest people, um, they can write criminal complaints, they can hand out parking tickets, um, they can um, run laser. I mean, uh, all those different things that they could do. So it, it happens quite a bit to where they might be a backup officer. They might stop to help an officer on a traffic stop. Um, they may, you may see them during the holiday season. I can't tell you how many times I, uh, I got to ride my bicycle around the mall and help out with some of the shopliftings and different things that were going on, uh, during the holiday season, um, as well as even bike patrol around balloon fiesta. These guys are out there every single day. I think five of them just on patrol every day. Um, right. taking calls, writing everything around. Okay, and a follow-up to that. Um, do, do the other um, commands um, or divisions, do they ever, how often do, do they call you? Like, do they offer that very often or how does that work? 
Oh yeah. Um, we get calls all the time, whether it's, um, and, and believe it or not, you may think it's just an open space call, but we may get a call because, you know, maybe there's a child lost and mm -hmm. let's just say it doesn't meet the state police search and rescue criteria. Maybe we just have a hunch, right? Like, uh, a, a child may have gone and he really likes water. Um, we don't know if he went down there. He likes to go hiking. Our family goes here. And these guys will be called, whether it's the foothills, the northeast, uh, any one of these area commands. And uh, they don't stop until the, the job gets done. I can tell you that. But, you know, we'll go out there and kind of look for those areas and have pretty good success rate on, on finding people that is not necessarily a full-blown search and rescue that we could just hand off to somebody else to take care of. Um, these guys are out there and um, assisting quite a bit on those calls for sure. Thank you. I appreciate you. Um, I just, um, I'm very concerned uh, that we have quite an investment in our open spaces. We've spent millions of dollars acquiring these lands and right now they're pretty pristine and I hate to see what will become of them without this team on hand, often patrolling and um, taking good care of, of the land that we've acquired. It's just, we're very, very, very blessed to have this. Other communities do not have the open spaces that we do. I'm talking about across the country and we sometimes we take that for granted. So thank you, that's all. All right, let's move on to the chief. We're, we're really spending a lot of time on this topic. So let's move on to the chief now. Great President team. Benton, uh, City Councilors, Councilor Bazan, thank you for giving us this opportunity. What we're going to do is uh, we're going to give a real quick uh, update on what we're trying to do. And this is what we're trying to accomplish is uh, we're trying to make the best use of our resources. We have limited resources. We know that uh, real quick. Uh, 24 camps located in the open space, 16 complaints from open space for 311, two fires, uh, one body recover, nine search and rescues, and, and uh, a lot of training and special events. And that's basically what uh, the load is for these five open space officers. Typically, a field officer is taking 15 calls per service per day, uh, taking up to five police reports. And there's a better investment for our resources than where we currently have them. But it's not saying we're not going to invest into these resources. Uh, we're going to pass it over a real quick recap of what our collateral program is going to look like. I am going to highlight one thing real quick. The number one case they mentioned up there for search and rescue, I was the commander over open space at the time. It was a heinous firefighter. And you're going to notice one thing about that case. It was not time sensitive and it would not have been, uh, and there would have been no impact reference us having a collateral person on call to respond to that uh, incident. Uh, other than that, I heard a lot of uh, feel good community policing things, which are great, uh, which we could accomplish with a collateral program, much like we do with our successful ambassador program. So I'll turn it over to Deputy Commander Meisinger and, and uh, Deputy Chief Smathers for a quick update of what the collateral program will look like, what our intentions are, and then I will close it up with a quick statement of, uh, of uh, the direction that we are going to go as a police department. Good evening. Uh, on Friday, we posted positions for uh, collateral uh, open space. We covered some search and rescue uh, duties and as well as respond to calls for service in the open space areas. Uh, the initial load for that would be about 10 to 12 officers with the idea that as people got trained up, we would continue to train additional uh, until we felt that, that uh, a sufficient staffing load had been achieved. Uh, the training for that would be sort of a three phase approach. Uh, the first would be largely what um, Officer Martinez discovered is familiarization, um, talking about where the areas are, talking about instead of navigating to an intersection, navigating to coordinates. So if uh, calls did come in uh, requesting assistance in a remote area, we would definitely have officers that could head out there in four-wheel drives or through alternate patrolman uh, means to be able to respond to those calls and um, deal with them as needed. Uh, moving on into phase two and then to phase three, we go into the more technical aspects of, of assisting with rescue calls or assisting with um, other so sorts of more specialized duties related to um, wildland fire if um, AFR needed help or, um, again, assisting with mountain rescue calls or remote rescue calls. 
Um, the level three of the training would be highly specialized skills uh, dealing with the water rescues and um, high angle rescues, um, but that would be farther down the road. Uh, but at this time, we'd really just start with getting people trained up quickly in the next two to four months on um, being able to fully respond to calls for service uh, in the open space when priority calls came out that required that, that response. You know, we do have a plan to go forward. Uh, like I talked about, we have, uh, we're hoping to get 12 additional uh, individuals who are going to be doing this collaterally. Uh, most of the examples you heard uh, for yourself do not require an immediate response. An on-call person would be able to do it. Our hope is to have three people on call at a time. That would be a four-week rotation between the four of them. Uh, you'd always have a primary, a secondary, and a third person that would be called out. There, This is also means for us to lean on our other partners. AFR actually has been involved in more search and rescues in the last 45 days than us. I think the numbers that they gave me were 45. Uh, they are greatly involved uh, in that process. We would lean on them to assist us during this time frame. We'd also have public service aides that we'd like to kind of call as our ambassadors to the outdoors. Uh, they could work hand in hand. A lot of the camps or issues that they're dealing with within the Bosque uh, would be a referral to ACS. And if not, uh, some of the uh, collateral officers would be offered uh, pro offered overtime on times to go in and do that. Uh, number one thing I'm going to say is uh, we haven't been afraid to take chances as a police department, and we've been very successful. One year ago, uh, there was a lot of criticism over our, our uh, homicide clearance rate. We worked hard. Uh, we made some changes that some people uh, internally questioned, and look where we're at now, 96% clearance rate. Uh, we continue to advance our traffic section. We have 66% more traffic citations issued this year. In the last 45 days, we took on uh, our call response. Uh, tomorrow, this week, we'll be announcing how we've shaved drastic time off the averages of that. Uh, you know, this is the decision that the, the chief's office, the executive office has sat down. We discussed. Uh, we think it's best for the police department, and uh, we want to give this a try. And if something doesn't work out and we have to revisit it in the future, we're more than happy uh, to revisit it. But we feel this will help us clear up uh, resources and it's a start. And there are other parts of the department that we can move going forward with collateral programs. And we do have already successful collateral programs within the department. Uh, we'll uh, stand for questions at this point. Um, I don't know where Mr. President is, but out oh, there. Uh, Mr. President, I don't know if you'd rather go with the other counselors first and then I'll. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I can't see everyone's hand. So please uh, alert me if you'd had your hand up. Uh, I can't see. Uh, I think I probably see everyone except uh, Councillor Sanchez and Councillor Grouse. So I know that Councillor Sanchez had his hand up. So he's next. Thank you, Mr. President. And um, I just believe that uh, Councillor Grout had a good line of questioning going before she was interrupted. Um, and uh, I've been interrupted before too, and I know that doesn't feel good. Um, one of the things that I'm looking at is, is that's very important is I'd like to ask the chief how the collateral officers are going to save a lawsuit if there's people out there using the open space and we're not there. It takes years. We just heard from Officer Martinez that it takes years to train and to develop, develop the institutional knowledge that's needed for these open space officers. Obviously, we go back to the open space being a direct asset to the citizens of Albuquerque. There's thousands and thousands of acres that are accessed each and every day by citizens of Albuquerque. And for individuals who do not have this institutional knowledge, we go, we go right back to what I've always been complaining about is we are losing the institutional knowledge um, within the city government that we have in Albuquerque, being replaced by deputy, deputy commanders, deputy directors all over the place. I say it over and over again, how, how this administration continues to fail at putting people where boots on the ground are needed. And that's what we need to hear. And I need to know what's going on in, in reference to what's gonna happen with all of the equipment, 
all of the, the institutional knowledge that's going to be walking right out the door uh, in reference to this. This is not just a police issue. This is an issue that affects the whole entire city and it affects the property that each and every individual that the city participates in. It's not just uh, a, a simple thing to do. This city council needs to weigh in on this and we need to weigh out, in on it in a, in, a, in a very, very specific manner. This is, this is something that in my opinion is needs to be held onto. Um, the equipment that's there is just thousands and thousands of dollars. The certifications that these officers have put themselves in, um, this goes back to all these other people who have the institutional knowledge who actually have been replaced by someone else. And then at that point, what do they do? They sit on their hands and they don't do the job that needs to be done. You take the wind out of their sails by replacing that. The real problem is, is putting boots on the ground to get it done. We need officers in this department. We need more officers than we have. And that is the biggest issue that we need to face. And I need to know what you're doing about that. President Benton, Councillor Sanchez, this is doing exactly what you're asking, putting more boots on the ground. These four individuals are going to Field Services Bureau. Uh, we'll determine where they go from there. But this is, council has requested time and time again, what are we going to do about the calls holding? What are we going to do about uh, this? This is a first step, is getting more resources out there. I kind of heard two questions amongst uh, everything that you're talking about. The other is like the external changes and the people who've been brought in as deputy commanders. Homicide is successful because we brought in outside views and we expanded our ability to think and how we handled investigations and we stopped doing things how we've been doing them since 1995, president, since Mr. I became. President, Mr. President, homicides since, are at an all time high. In I this thought we league. talked about interrupting at one another. All time high, Chief. Uh, Councilor, you're, you're complaining high. about interrupting, and now you're interrupting. I want to hear what the chief is continue, was was saying, it, and then we'll get back to you. We've got a queue of people wanting to ask questions, but but you'll be you'll be continued with your questioning if if the chief can finish what he was saying. Uh, you know, homicides are at an all time high, and so is our clearance rate. And some of those changes that we made within homicide by bringing in outside views, outside influence, has been imperative. You look at our settlement agreement, that's another area we brought in outside people to look and help us and carve a path out forward. You know, this department has struggled for years, all the way back to 1989, 1995 when I was here. For the first time, we were really moving in a strong direction. We have so many improvements in so many areas, and a lot of that has to do with that we're thinking outside the box and we're doing things not typically how we always did them, but we're looking at new ways of doing things. And sometimes they don't work perfect. And sometimes we go back to the drawing table and we change it, but we will continue to bring in new ideas, new ways to do things. And I hope that we continue to move this department forward in so many different aspects that, that we've seen in the past year. And I'll talk about homicide clearance rates, DOJ, number of citations, traffic fatalities. Let's not cling on to the one thing that, yeah, we're struggling with. And we've publicly admitted that we have a homicide problem, but a lot of people in the community recognize that the police department itself is not the only entity that has to work and be functioning properly for homicide rates to go down. That is a criminal justice system issue. It is a problem that's occurring across this nation. It is a problem that has to do with, with a lot of different factors. And it's not just the Albuquerque Police Department or the that their actions are causing the rise in homicide numbers across the country. Councilor Sanchez, continue. This goes back to what we've been saying, Chief. I'd like to ask the Chief, how many officers right now are working field services, answering calls for service in my district right now? And send me a copy of the, uh, of the um, lineup so I can see exactly how many officers are working that district today, right now. I'd like to know okay. that which officers are answering the calls for service. Uh, my question still wasn't answered. What are we doing to raise the amount of officers that for boots on the ground? That's where we are lacking. There's still issues with petty crimes. 
I see every single day the drug use being out there out of control. We don't have a narcotics unit. We don't have a SWAT team. We don't have a gang unit. Um, all of those things are a direct effect on the fact that there is we have no officers. The failure is not having enough officers on the police department. So how are we addressing that issue? President Pinkin, uh, Councillor Sanchez, you know, we talked about it. Uh, this is a step in the right direction, getting more boots on the ground. Uh, we graduated today an academy class of approximately 30 more individuals. We have another academy class coming. I mean, we've gone, we've gone over this several times during city council meetings that, yes, we, we are having success in recruiting. We've slowed down retirements. We've only had two retirements over the past two months. Once we or three, once we introduce the the retention uh, program that we have, so uh, there is a lot of things uh, that we've been doing. And if at any time you'd like to sit down, uh, have a cup of coffee, and talk about what we're doing uh, to keep up uh, retention and recruit, we're more than happy. And then you could go back and report it to your constituents. Uh, but for the sake of of time and making sure that everybody is able to answer their questions, uh, I, I think we've done quite a bit and we've explained it. Uh, quite in depth over uh, past several council, city council meetings. My constituents are still telling me that their safety is still at the utmost concern. They're still dealing with the drugs in the streets. They're still dealing with the property crimes and the businesses. They're still dealing with the issues that we have talked about over and over again. And we still have not raised the amount of officers on the department. That's by your own words. When are we going to see um, the authorized strength of 1,200 officers on our department and how many officers are working field services right now, not just in uniform, minus the sergeants, the lieutenants, minus any other specialized units that are in uniform. How many people are answering the citizens' calls for service right now, Chief? 1742 was the time I wrote down when you asked me that question, and I will have a CAD mailed to you showing what officers are working Northeast Area Command at 1742 when you originally asked me that question. We've had this conversation numerous times. We've talked about recruiting efforts. We've talked about uh, processes and trying to hire more. We've talked about trying to carve out sworn resources to, to do more sworn resource job. And as in this case, have uh, civilian uh, increases help us do jobs that don't require a badge and a gun. Uh, I don't know how much more I can answer that question. Uh, like I said, uh, obviously, we could sit and talk about this uh, at a later time, but we've answered that question. I'm still at, I'm still waiting for the response. How many officers are working field services right now? You're the chief. You should know that. Answering calls Pres for Pres service. President Benton, Councillor Sanchez, I do not have the amount of officers who are working Northwest right now. Uh, I simply don't. I've left previous meetings and I've come here uh, directly from another meeting. So, you know what, I will email you how many officers are working now by the end of the night. That would be perfect. Thank you. Councillor Feeble Corn is next. And then I think Councillor Grout and uh, who else helped me out here is councillors. That's all I see, Mr. President. Okay, Councillor Feeble Corn. Thank you, Mr. President. I, um, as a frequent open space user, and, and there are many people in my district that are, um, you know, really appreciate the open space in Albuquerque, and they're very concerned about this issue. I just wanted to ask a few questions just to clarify so that we understand the change that's being proposed. Um, so, Chief Medina, um, a lot of the things that I heard about earlier, um, the education, the community events, the teaching, the training, um, are those things that that you feel could be done by someone that's not an actual police officer? Uh, President Benton, uh, Council, Councilor Feeblecorn, yes, absolutely. That is exactly what we're trying to accomplish is ensuring that during this time of shortage, every sworn officer is having the biggest impact on crime that we can in the city. Uh, teaching kids from, I, I respect that we want to teach kids and be role models. Uh, we have, uh, they could have opportunities to do that as a collateral off duty during their time time off. Uh, we're not saying that we don't want them to continue doing that. 
but we are saying that that's an extra duty and and uh, we could also hire civilians and get other individuals to help with some of that those activities Thank you, Mr. President, um, Chief Medina. So the collateral officers that you're um, advertising for, are those actual police officers or those are, are not law enforcement officers? Those are gonna, uh, Council President Benton, uh, Councilor Feeblecorn, those are gonna be sworn officers who will kind of be on an on-call status to respond to these emergency situations uh, within the Bosque or the open spaces. And we will also have permanently assigned PSAs uh, who are always out there uh, assisting with, with a lot of these duties that don't require a sworn law enforcement officer. Okay, thank you, um, Chief. So it, it, it sounds like the, the new folks would be able to fill the role of what I think of as more of a park ranger kind of role. Um, and then we would still have police officers available to respond to emergencies in open space. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Uh, President Menton, Councilor Feeblecorn, that's absolutely correct. And for those that don't know, I actually have a, my background is prior to becoming, coming to the Albuquerque Police Department, I worked for the Carson National Forest. Uh, I was a forest ranger. I did biology work. Uh, Carson National Forest, uh, of all the ranger districts at the time, they only had two permanently sworn individuals assigned. Uh, those individuals dealt with the violations of law and the rest of the uniform process uh, services for forest service were the eyes and ears, and they were the the presence out in our national forests. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Mr. President. Councilor Bassan, and then Councilor Grout, did you also want to follow up? Mr. President, Councilor Grout was first, and then I can I just have a few questions to finish out. All right, all right, Councilor uh, Grout. Thank you, Mr. President. I just have a couple questions. Chief, congratulations on the 30 new officers that were sworn in today. It was a privilege to see that happen. Um, um, it, I was thinking about myself, if one of those were my children um, going to protect our city and um, it kind of, it, it, it was special. So thank you. Um, but I want to get back to um, how many miles of open space do we have that they patrol, that these fellows patrol? I mean, 30,000 acres. 30, 30, acres of open space in the city of Albuquerque. And for comparison, uh, the Pueblo of Laguna is 550,000 acres. And we only had eight individuals who were patrolling it uh, at the most uh, at a given time. Uh, so you can see the disparity. Like I, I brought the example also of the Carson National Forest. You could look at our national forest, the widespread amount of space and uh, the amount of resources they're given. And we have a very high uh, ratio of the amount of property that the city of Albuquerque owns and the amount of sworn resources that we have dedicated to it. Thank you. Okay, two more questions. Who's gonna be patro patrolling all of these um, special lands that we have? Uh, President Benton, uh, Councilor Grout, I think that's where, uh, why we're giving these ambassadors, uh, we have to get these ambassadors who are going to be PSAs. We have to get them out into the open space. They need to be the eyes. They need to be the ears. Uh, they need to be the, the people that are watching. Uh, let's be realistic. We don't have high crime within our open space. We don't want it to get high crime, but we do want them reporting back if there is crime scene. And that's when we make a plan and we address it uh, realistically. Uh, unless the crime occurs right there in front of the open space officer, it's going to be us reacting and proactively uh, try, uh, reactively trying to investigate a crime that's already occurred. I think there is a better way. And what we're saying is we're going to try this out. If it doesn't work, uh, then we're not above uh, stepping back and saying, let's reevaluate and see how we make this work. Okay. Two more questions now. <laughs> um, how long is we're going to try this? You know, we'll evaluate it at six months. We'll see okay. what it's looking like, uh, how things are going, and uh, and we'll make a decision at that point if we're, what modifications we have to make and, and what direction we're going to continue to go. Okay, and my last question. You mentioned that these five officers are going to be going into the field um, because we're always asking 
where are the people coming, you know, to be on boots on the ground? How many of these five officers will actually be patrolling our streets? Council President Benton, uh, Councillor Grout, all of them have to go into the bid. That's per our collective bargaining agreement. And I've heard that some officers said they're not going to go uh, into the field, that they're going to try to get promoted or they'll go into a specialized position. That they may be able to test into that at a later time, but none of them are going to go directly from open space to somewhere that they have not tested for per our CBA. And uh, nobody's going to go to another position and get promoted without passing the promotional process. So as it stands, they're all going to go to the field. And that's not saying that in the near future that we're not going to decide that there is a place where they could accomplish more things. Uh, Councillor Grout, you're well aware that we TDY'd two individuals to your Foothills PRT. Those mm -hmm. two individuals on swing shift PRT have uh, been able to uh, arrest over 55 felons uh, in the past 45 days. Uh, they've had a huge impact in the area of Tramway and Central. And there's no saying that at, when the time comes that we won't make a decision to grow that PRT team because this is about a balance making sure we still have resources to be proactive in taking people to jail and making sure that we're keeping up with our call volume the best way that we can. Thank you, Chief. That's all. Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, thank you for entertaining this conversation. I know it's long and we have a, wing, a lengthy agenda. I promise you I've whittled down my questions from 20 to six, mm -hmm. um, but most of them have been answered. Chief, I also really appreciate the answers to these questions. I know that given my personal experience of late, I, you know, I recognize we don't get to tell you how and what and which way you run your department. So I appreciate your helping answer the questions that the public has been asking that I now am asking uh, on other other levels. So um, one is, although Councillor Grout kind of asked a certain version of the question, um, who I, I didn't realize that the open space unit would go on actual rescues per se when someone needed help. So now that I know that that is something that they do frequently, uh, who is going to go and help someone? Should they get stuck somewhere or need assistance with some kind of um, getting lost or whatever might happen? Who is going to go and do the rescue when people call for help? Counselor, uh President Benton, Councillor Bazan, uh, the collateral uh, individuals working, like we talked about, there would always be three individuals on call. Uh, they would be called out, but it's not an APD only response as it stands right now. Uh, I have a uh, uh, AFR here and, and they could talk about the fact that they respond to these calls and we are gonna lean on AFR. We are gonna lean, we already have uh, uh, Sandia Mountain Rescue Search and Rescue responding to a lot of these calls. There's different entities, so we are going to rely uh, heavily on some of our partners and till we get our collaterals up and running, and we're going to continue to try to develop a group. Uh, I'd love to see a core group of individuals that are already civilian employees with uh, open space uh, get trained up on uh, search and rescue. I'd love for all the PSAs assigned to get trained up and become uh, certified in search and rescue. So th this is a move that along with getting more boots on the ground uh, in the field is also uh, going to hopefully expand the number of people we have available for search and rescue in the long run by not just focusing on sworn officers, but bringing in as many partners and training as many civilians as possible. Uh, Chief Mount, do you have anything you wanna add about AFR's response or abilities? Unless they have any questions. Nope. Unless anybody has any questions, well, AFR is here to, to answer any questions if necessary. Okay, Mr. President, Chief, I just I'm I'm happy to hear that AFR is there to be able to be aware of this because I just want to make sure that if someone calls for help, we respond, right? Whether that is APD, AFR, search and rescue, whoever that is. Um, so I think that that's a concern that was mine, but also from others in the public as well. Um, are on the list of statistics that you gave, are all open space calls included in the stats on that list? And are do those also include um, calls for assistance? Uh, Councillor, uh, 
was on initially some of the stats we had. We also learned that uh, 311 complaints to open space are also included, are not included in that. Uh, during the past 90 days, 311 uh, reported 16 uh, welfare checks that they wanted open space to, to conduct. A lot of these uh, do not require a sworn law enforcement officer, and uh, some of them do, requ do require just checking to see if there is a encampment there. Uh, as we know the process, uh, these encampments are dealt with within a process of us getting uh, other resources out uh, to eventually take it down. And uh, this is something we do in partnership. And we already do it throughout the city. We plan uh, with family and community. We plan with solid waste. We plan with everybody how we do them outside of the Bosque. And this is a great opportunity for us to plan with our partners that with the process we already have developed outside of open space to carry that over into open space, utilize less sworn resources and get the same results with, with part camps being cleaned up when necessary. And thank you, Chief. And Mr. President, Chief, there's currently $1.4 million allocated and designated for the open space division. Uh, where, where is APD, where are you planning on reallocating that funding? This uh, budget is not is for the whole section, which includes open space, horse mounted unit, homeland security. It does not include uh, air support, and uh, it is entirely uh, it is uh, just under 1.2 million that we use on salaries. Uh, like I stated, when people get called out, we're going to have to fund the overtime. When we have special uh, operations where we need them to go out we may have to pay overtime. So without a doubt, there is the possibility that this could be used uh, for overtime. Uh, we have six months or five months before uh, the next, through the next budgeting cycle to see what the impact of overtime is. And we can make the request properly to council is whether we move this, leave this funding as a operational expense with salaries for open space, or if we move it to an overtime funding source for open space. But I think that this is a good opportunity. Uh, uh, and uh, remember, open space only utilizes ten dollars to $20,000 in overtime per year. So yes, we're gonna see an increase in that uh, Not uh, equipment. So uh, equipment, so we probably will see an increase in overtime and uh, we are gonna want to keep the ten to 20,000 a year for the equipment maintenance and everything that we do with it. And that, that leads me to my last question, actually. That was a good segue, Chief. So will the city keep all of the, the equipment that already belongs to the unit? Uh, I know that there is, you know, the, the water craft and different, uh, different other materials and equipment that belong to this division that I don't even have the experience of knowing all about. But at the same time, are we keeping the equipment? What's going to happen with it? The maintenance? Uh, how often do we think it'll be used? A little bit about the equipment part, please. Uh, President uh, Benton, Councillor Bazan, yes, we will be keeping the equipment. Uh, you know, there's nothing to say that next 4th of July, if we have a very dry July season, that we don't temporarily assign for 45 days, which is allowable under our collective bargaining agreement, three collateral open space officers to patrol the Bosque for the fear of fires. There's nothing that says that during the flood season, we don't call an audible and we assign three of our collateral individuals to uh, the airboat or the hovercraft to be on our waterways during this time. We are going to limit certain things. We're going to limit the number of dive members we have. Uh, you, we heard a little bit about it. It's used for recovery of firearms, sometimes recovery of a body. Uh, we are going to limit the number of those individuals and, and we'll, we'll make sure that we have adequate coverage for uh, cross training for the boat. So there are some places where we're going to limit the amount of time and effort because just remember every certified officer when it comes to reoccurring mandatory training, that's time they spend away from the field uh, to get that uh, done. Thank you, Chief. Uh, thank you for answering these questions. I know that there's probably going to be more headed your way at some point, but I really you know, I think that it's our job to ask the questions, especially for the public and for everybody involved. So I think the dialogue is important. Uh, Mr. President, thank you for the entertainment of the conversation. Thank you, Councillor. And uh, yeah, I do take this seriously. We do have a huge agenda tonight and 93 people signed up to speak publicly. So uh, 
you know, we, we can't spend all night on one topic. That's all, that's all there is to it. Okay, uh, uh, are we ready for the uh, complete streets presentation? Mr. President, um, I understand that uh, the folks from DMD will be sharing their screen directly from the mayor's conference room, so we should be good to go. Thanks for your patience. So I apologize for the technical difficulties. Uh, my name is Jennifer Morrow. I am the Deputy Director for Municipal Development, and I have with me Valerie Hermanson, who is the Public Works Strategic Program Manager. Um, so, and we want to present to you complete streets. So basically, we're going to start with a uh, definition of what are complete streets. And essentially these are streets that we look at all modes of transportation, the pedestrian, bicyclist, motorists, um, and even the bus uh, systems. And we use, we look into that when we are looking at the planning of the design and the construction of uh, projects as we're doing them throughout the city. Uh, we look at all ages and the biggest uh, huge focus that we have is on safety. We look at a, uh, design features and you're gonna hear me talk about later the toolbox. And I think we're probably gonna use the term uh, one size does not fit all when it comes to complete streets quite a bit. Uh, here are some of the basic to, uh, design features that we do look at. We might look into um, roundabouts, various traffic calming, wider sidewalks, road diets. And like I said, we'll go into more detail with that as we get into this presentation. The city first passed the Complete Streets Ordinance in 2015, and an updated version kind of based on some lessons learned with the implementation of Complete Streets. Um, and some of the major changes that were reflected in that updated ordinance are strength and language about project applicability. It also included Vision Zero. The city um, acknowledged a Vision Zero approach in May of 2019. And lastly, it included equity considerations and also opportunities for prioritizing projects based on equity measures. The Complete Streets Ordinance called for consideration of hiring an active transportation coordinator. I also serve as the Vision Zero coordinator, and so there's a lot of overlap between our Complete Streets approach, as well as how we're approaching Vision Zero and reaching our zero traffic fatalities and serious injuries by 2040. We also have a vacant bicycle planner position um, which we also expect to include pedestrian planning activities to have that bike ped planner position. Our teams participate in a variety of trainings from Smart Growth America to the National Complete Streets Coalition to even Federal Highway Administration. In 2020, the city became a member of the National Association of City Transportation Officials, also known as NACTO, who's leading the way in transportation innovation and policy and planning and programs. And I should note that in the Complete Streets Ordinance, it highlights several of these bikeway guides highlighted here um, for staff to follow when incorporating complete streets into our transportation planning projects. Our staff will also have access to NACTO experts um, that are world-renowned experts, uh, peer city staff, as well as um, different exchanges um, and participation in their annual conference. And I should note that I was lucky enough to participate in NACTO's fall conference and it was a really great opportunity to meet peer cities and learn from them and also bring some of those best practices back to Albuquerque to incorporate into our planning and projects. Uh, so implementation, there's several uh, different areas where we do implement the complete streets. New construction, this can be done uh, via our planning department with subdividers and developers. We have them, uh, the planning department ensures that the complete streets requirements are met. And then when we do our street rehabilitation, our maintenance, we can do full reconstructions. Sometimes we just, and the full reconstruction would be taking out the, the base and, and replacing it from the dirt level up. 
uh, asphalt replacement would just be replacing the asphalt. We have mill and inlay, and this is when we mill off about two inches of asphalt and replace it with two inches of new asphalt. And then a curb line, line mill and inlay, which a curb line mill and inlay involves just milling at the curb line so that we get a flush um, when we put on another two inches, we're flush at that curb line, uh, but we're actually increasing the height of the, the road at the center. Then some of our minor maintenance is a microsurfacing, and this is putting a thin layer of asphalt over the top, and also we do a fog seal. So Jennifer mentioned we're, we're going to kind of talk about how complete streets is not a one-size-fits-all approach, and there's a lot of design considerations when um, applying complete streets principles to our roadways to better serve all of our communities and make them more uh, multimodal. So this list provides, you know, some of the items that staff consider when incorporating complete streets. Um, and that map on the upper right-hand corner of your screen is the Mid-Region Council of Government's long-range bikeway system. This plays a really big role in adding new bikeway facilities when we're repaving and rehabbing our roadways. So when we're retrofitting our streets um, it, on, that, on that map, if it has a proposed facility, then we can um, consider incorporating that with our projects. So on that map, the dashed lines are proposed facilities with the uh, regular lines existing bikeway facilities. And we know based on national best practices that designing safe streets for all roadway users is a best practice in Vision Zero approach. And so I really am hitting home this complete streets are a, very, are a big key strategy for us to reach our Vision Zero goals. The ordinance called for the creation of a new active transportation committee or the reconfiguration of an existing committee. And so we have the city's uh, Albuquerque Bicycling Advisory Committee, also known as GABAC, and we were able to reorganize that group into the Greater Albuquerque Active Transportation Committee, also known as GATSI. The committee has nine seats, of which eight of them are currently filled. We have great public participation, as well as staff and peer agency participation. Um, GATSI advises the mayor, city council, city departments, and divisions on projects, policies, programs, that improve and or impact active transportation within Albuquerque. So I mentioned before our toolbox. So this is a little bit more comprehensive list of the toolbox. And the idea is, you know, sometimes you need a screwdriver, sometimes you need a wrench. Um, so each street we look at individually and we look at the best way to address it. Um, if we're looking for at speeding, we look to traffic calming, uh, we might do road diets to slow down the traffic. Uh, roundabouts are one of my favorites. I always think those are a great enhancement to uh, move traffic as well as keeping it, stopping people from speeding as much. Um, and these are all the different ways that we look into this. For pedestrians, we have lots of options on crosswalks. Uh, sometimes it's just timing the signals at the pedestrian at uh, the signalized intersections and making sure there's median refuges at the islands in between. And some places we put our pedestrian hybrid beacon called a PHB or sometimes referred to as a high intensity, um, uh, I can't remember the acronym, the HAWK system, sorry. Um, so we always look at, at what fits for each street. So each street is evaluated independently. And so, um, as I said, our annual street maintenance projects are one of the places that we really make sure that we um, take care of our complete streets. And our maintenance system, it starts with a, a street condition survey. It involves this van, we hire a company that has this van that has, does a 3D laser evaluation of every street in the city of, Los, or city of Albuquerque. And it, um, our last evaluation was in 2021. We do this every five years. The company that we work with is called Road, Roadway Asset Services. And then we take this data and it goes into a program and it generates our street maintenance program. And it, we look at about five years, but we can have it generate even longer, further out than that. And a lot of it's based on our budget and capacity at the time. So then we have a list of streets that are gonna get maintained based on an unbiased data-driven system. And um, then once we know which streets we want to have uh, that year for the maintenance, we take this to our complete streets evaluation team. This 
consists of council services, uh, municipal development department, as well as ABQ ride planning, Mr. Cog, the Gatsy group, and, um, and then any public representatives that wanna be involved in the evaluation. Uh, our primarily what we evaluate is signage and striping. Those are our kind of our, uh, the main items we can hit with our maintenance programs and try and improve those systems for and bring our um, to address our complete streets ordinance. Um, and then the DMD, we submit a memo to the city council outlining these roadways that are to be repaved and restriped in the configuration. So here is from 2019 to 2023 up to current, what we're looking at. Um, these are the, the streets that uh, of arterial roads that we have involved in this. We are not showing residential roads, even though we do maintenance on residential roads. And this is because we don't have a lot of opportunities for road diets and for striping um, in those locations. So we know that changing the way that our roads are designed can influence and encourage better behavior. And so each year when we do the rehab and the repaving that Jennifer was just talking about, it's an opportunity to put our roads back better than the way that they were. And so we always look for opportunities, not only multimodal, but especially for people walking and biking since those are our more vulnerable roadway users. So, and if the, the roadway context supports it, and there's enough space, as you can see, this is a really great opportunity to add new bike lanes or buffered bike lanes, or in the bottom right photo, that's an example of some buffer striping that we tried out on San Mateo, just north of Montgomery. The roadway contacts didn't support bike lanes, but we were able to narrow the travel lanes to encourage drivers to slow down. We added that buffer space in between the outside travel lane and the sidewalk, which provides a little bit more comfort, comfort for people walking on sidewalks. I want to note first and foremost, the next two maps are in draft, so they are not um, comprehensive of every single project, um, but it's a work in progress and hopefully it gives you an idea of what we're working toward. So currently as part of our Vision Zero efforts, we brought on a consultant to put together a year in review and a prioritization strategy, and they're gathering different metrics and understanding what projects have we implemented, what projects are under study and in design, um, and, and it also includes complete streets. And so complete streets I mentioned are a great way that we're gonna reach our vision zero goals. So hopefully this map is uh, you know work in progress and we'll be able to share a revised version soon. Uh, the pink are related to pedestrian facilities and that includes leading pedestrian intervals. Jennifer mentioned PHBs or Hawk signals, um, uh, high visibility crosswalks. The uh, orangey peachy color is multimodal. And so that tends to address uh, more than one mode, not just one mode specifically. Mm -hmm. The green are including bike facilities. Um, and so those are all pillars. And then moving on to the next map, we have different projects that are in planning and design. Um, and again, this is draft. It's not everything, not all inclusive, um, but hopefully you see that we're working to create a system that we can easily track our traffic safety improvements um, and have a better idea of what's working and where and where we can replicate it um, across our city. And with that, Mr. President and members of the council, we wanna say thank you so much for having us. We, we appreciate your time. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, thanks for the presentation. Councilor Fubelkorn, you wanna? Yes, sir, thank you, Mr. President. Um, and thank you for the informative presentation. I really appreciate it. I do have a quick question. Um, not sure who the best person to answer is, but I'll just throw it out there. I. I love all these projects. I love Vision Zero. I know we've put a, quite a bit of money into it. Could someone just talk through how projects are chosen? What metrics are we using and how are they being evaluated after they're finished? So this is Jennifer. Thank you, Councillor Fabelkorn, uh, President. Um, so there's different methods of selecting projects. We, the one that I can talk to the most easily is the, um, the maintenance projects because those are done by our street maintenance survey where we actually get the data and it runs through a program and, it, and the program itself tells us which ones. There are other mechanisms and a lot of them are driven by the council themselves where um, if they have um, ones that are on their agenda that they want to see um, some improvements done. 
as well as um, we get capital outlay uh, funding and, and such for us to do larger projects. Some of them are collaborations with the city of Bernalillo or the county of Bernalillo um, and with maybe a MAFCA or some other entity that um, they have a project and the city um, collaborates with them to get those done. So it, it there's many different uh, um, ways that projects can be selected for this. Thank you, um, Mr. President. One more question. Um, and then what kind of evaluation is being done post project to see which ones were the most effective? Uh, you know, is there any kind of um, research, you know, hindsight to help us move forward in a better manner? Um, yes, thanks, President Councilor. Uh, we are in the process of procuring a, um, a data system that will actually record where we can look at uh, our corridors. A lot of it we focus on our high fatality corridors and our, our high accident and injury corridors. And we're actually in the process of procuring some software that would make this more easy for us to look at it and see the difference that that these changes have been made when we've restriped or um, uh, uh, done, you know, added bike lanes that we can look at these corridors and, and see that. So we are hoping in the next year or so that we can start having that kind of data, um, data available, readily available. Thank you. That's all I had, Mr. President. Uh, just a quick question for myself. Um, the uh, the committee that reviews uh, just our regular maintenance projects and our opportunities that come up just on that in the course of regular maintenance of the roadways, is that, is that still meeting and advising the department? Um, Councillor Benton, I actually might ask if Pat could help me out. I'm relatively new and I haven't been involved in one of these committees yet. I don't know if Val has. Oh, um, yes, Mr. Okay. President, it is, it is currently meeting. Yeah. Okay. And that's that's a group that consists of, of uh, the COG as well, right? Yes, it does. Or is, is that how is that how is that committee constituted, Val? Um, I, I should give a shout out to Shanna Schultz from City City Council because I know she does provide some assistance in putting that group together and helping us to organize those meetings. Mr. President, um, I call it a pretty informal committee. There's no you know formal appointments to this, but it's a uh, several departments, including council services, transit, planning, Mr. Cog. Uh, we have a couple of representatives from the community who are active in the bicycling or pedestrian community. And we all sit around a virtual table these last couple of years and look at, you know, 20 ish roadway designs and kind of comment on where improvements could be made. Uh, we are still meeting. Um, I suspect we'll start to get together probably in the spring to do the next round of roadway designs. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I just as the original sponsor of the, the uh, legislation, um, you know, our original, our focus was was not so much on new streets, because a lot of the new roadways, just it's, it's standard practice to incorporate a lot of what we're, you, you all were talking about. But when we rehab an older street, that's an opportunity as well. It's maybe not as sexy and, and as expensive, but, but it can be very effective. So, um, you know, and, and we wanted to really emphasize that, especially with regard to some of the older parts of the city where, you know, things were built for the automobile and not much more, you know, and, and very substandard uh, facilities for pedestrians. And um, so it's always, uh, I find it more challenging really than, than, than designing new road, roadways, which I think we know how to do pretty well. But um, thanks for uh, bringing this up, Councilor Fieberporn, and thanks, uh, to the department and, and uh, our Vision Zero coordinator for, for bringing us up to speed with it. All right, we will move on. Let me get back to my, to my script here. All right, uh, we have no uh, economic development discussion tonight. We'll move on to general public comments and uh, members of the public can provide public comment to the council virtually if they've signed up 
per the instructions published in our agendas on, on the uh, typically on Friday prior to the meetings. And uh, in the case of the large number of people that signed up tonight, we're only going to have a minute per person for your public comment. And I apologize for that. It's just we've got a, a, a very lengthy agenda and quite a few people wanting to speak. So we will get started. Uh, and uh, I think we know the ground rules. Any comments should be addressed to the counselors only and through the council or president uh, to be recognized. So uh, no disruptive comment, uh, conduct, et cetera. Mr. Cornelius, please call the name of the first speaker. Thank you, Mr. President. Our first speaker is Brian Schobel, followed by Christopher Ramirez. Oh, can you hear me? Uh, thank we you for letting me have this moment. I just want to say again, I, I spoke last time in regards to the zero fares, to please allow them to stay the way they are. I really do appreciate the two counselors that talked about the genuine data in regards to how the instances on the bus have increased, but it's also proportional to ridership. So I wanted to say thank you to you guys also for addressing that last time, but please don't put in any barriers in regards to setting up a way of tracking. I mean, it just doesn't seem like it would be a benefit to people who, especially people who already have a difficulty in their life and may have even more difficulties even just accessing public transportation of any kind. So that is my biggest concern when I wanted to address. Thank you. Our next speaker is Christopher Ramirez, followed by Saeed Mati Hussain. Saeed Mati Hussaini, followed by Joseph Friedman. Hello, my name is Saeed Mati Hussaini. Thank you for having me and uh, giving me an opportunity to speak about zero fares and why it's important for a person like me that grew up in the Middle East. And when, when first I came here, it was challenging for me to get around the city and go to school in martial arts. Based on my experience, it was hard to pay every time my bus pass was expired or when I didn't have bus pass and I had to pay. During zero fares, I have seen and heard from other refugee families who have benefited from the free fares and that includes getting access to resources, their resources to their families need. I think it will be um, a good opportunity for everyone in the city to have free transportation to get around and based on the data that was collected, it shows that uh, the safety is increased than before and the bus riders increased as well. So thank you. Joseph Friedman followed by Xavier Barraza. Yes, uh, thank you. Can, can I be heard? You can. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, I wanted to uh, comment on the uh, proposal to change the uh, policing in the open space. And uh, I'm the president of a neighborhood association here. And I think there's really a general consensus that the open space is the jewel of Albuquerque. <clears throat> it's the reason why people move here. It's the reason that I'm here and a lot of people that I know. And so we would be very concerned if there was a downgrading in uh, in the public uh, maintenance uh, of safety and uh, the facilities in the open space. So I just like to support the comments made by count by Councillor Grout previously, and uh, we we are concerned if, if you're replacing uh, a sworn police with some unspecified type of. Thank you. Xavier Barraza, followed by Jeannie Allen.
Jeannie Allen, followed by Jesus Hernandez. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Jesus. Um, and I just wanted to say uh, Zero First has made a huge impact for me. Um, also, having a disability, it's always been hard for me to get to where I need to be because getting a ride from people can be hard. Um, because some are either busy or have a, a vehicle that isn't always accessible for me. Sometimes the only option I have is to use the Sunman and, and or use the city bus. Having zero fares makes it easier for me because I don't have to pay or have an ID or sticker pass on me. In the past, when I didn't have my sticker pass or when it expired, I wasn't able to get anywhere. If I wasn't able to pay, I have missed many rides and opportunities because of this. Keeping zero first makes it much easier for me and others with disabilities to access and be where we need to be. Christopher Ramirez, followed by Cynthia Rodriguez. Christopher, are you there? Cynthia Rodriguez, followed by Tina Kuchel. Hi, my name is Cynthia. I'm an organizer with the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Uh, this meeting, you guys have started to talk about how, again, to police homeless people in encampment places, still no resources for where they'll go, um, or how to address like the homeless issue that's actually going on in the city. A lot of yelling about how to fund more policing, but not housing at all. And in this year, there's been at least 18, well, there's been 18 shootings involving police officers. I don't understand why we would want to fund that more um, as a solution to a situation that actually requires housing, healthcare, um, and access to like jobs and things like that. So I would just like to really say, you know, the things that are on this agenda, like taking away zero fares for all and trying to bring back qualified immunity are very tone deaf to the needs of the people of the city of Albuquerque. Mia Augustusson, followed by Barbara Taylor. A good evening and congratulations, Councillor Pena. Uh, some new information has come to light regarding skyrocketing rents in the region. A an active cartel is now the subject of a Department of Justice investigation. Uh, this cartel is accused of having uh, been fixing prices and manipulating rental markets nationwide, including student housing, senior housing, and Section 8 housing. Seven U.S. states have already initiated class actions. I myself am laboring to make New Mexico the eighth. I hope for, in fact, I think it appropriate to expect your support in these endeavors, because if we fail, uh, these new construction efforts that we have been sold as a panacea for skyrocketing rents will be nothing but thousands more apartments going at insane rates. Thank you, I appreciate your time. Uh, please uh, contact me for details. Next up is Barbara Taylor, followed by Carl Holm. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I am a former director of the Parks and Rec Department, and I'm a member of the Open Space Advisory Board, which has voted unanimously against disbanding uh, the APS Open Space Unit. Here's the training that you will be losing. Um, they are, the open space unit officers are trained EMTs, essential to injured hikers. They are swift water technicians and trained divers for evidence collection and God forbid body recovery. They are trained airboat drivers for river patrol, essential for fire detection and body recovery. They are trained um, rope 
rescue technicians trained to rescue an individual evidence or recovery in the mountains. They are law enforcement certified ATV and bike patrol officers. It's just not clear um, what is gained by reassigning these guys? It means the foot. Uh, uh, Ms. Taylor is on the Open Space Advisory Board. I'll allow her, allow her to finish her comment quickly. Um, it, it means that the foothills and Bosky and the people who enjoy these areas will be left without protection. Response to crime or injury will be delayed. Parking lots will be subject to vandalism. And in the end, Street patrol will have to be diverted in to respond in open space anyway. Thank you, Mr. President, very much. Thank you. Carl, Carl Holm, followed by Stephen Glass. Stephen Glass, followed by Sarah Malone. Just to make clear, everyone who's watching, if you if you are intending to speak with regard to the zero fares, uh, I wanted to let everyone know that is being deferred tonight. It will not be voted upon tonight. Uh, I think there will be a uh, floor substitute moved and then it will be deferred until the meeting of January 4th. I, I apologize. I was on mute. I didn't realize uh, I'm Steve Glass. So do I still have a few seconds to make a public comment or have I lost? Please proceed, Steve. Yes, I, I'm, I apologize. I am Steve Glass. I'm the president of the Open Space Alliance, which is the official... Um, a non nonprofit support group for the open space division. And I'd just like to echo everything that Barbara Taylor said uh, on behalf of the Alliance that uh, we really, really have a very unique situation with open space in Albuquerque and, and we need a unique uh, police force to, uh, to help us maintain uh, you know, order and, and uh, the law in that area. So I oppose the uh, disbanding of the open space. Uh, division, I mean the Open Space Enforcement Division. Sarah Malone, followed by Rex Funk. Councillor Benton, other council members, I implore you to keep safe outdoor spaces in the IDO. Since the August closure of Coronado Park, Many unhoused folks roam daily in search of corners in which to camp, avoiding overcrowded, unhealthy, and unsafe shelters. I know a Hispanic woman cited for sleeping in the dog park and an indigenous man for sleeping in the cemetery. People must move frequently and are subject to routine city sweeps even in winter. If we do not maintain safe outdoor spaces in the IDO, I propose a new motto. Albuquerque, New Mexico, the city with parks for dogs, cemeteries for dead people, but no safe outdoor spaces for unhoused human beings. Please do the right thing. Vote to retain safe outdoor spaces in the IDO, a decision that benefits one Albuquerque. Rex Funk followed by Peggy Norton. Mr. President and members of the City Council, I'm Rex Funk, and I was served as the superintendent, the first superintendent of the Open Space Division from uh, 1984 to 1994. I'd just like to say a couple of things about the different priorities of the open space versus uh, APD. Uh, listening to the chief talk about the program, it's very clear to me that APD is a, a very different uh, program than, than open space patrol and uh, resource protection. It's more reactive and it's focused on crime and it's crisis driven. Open space on the other hand is focused more on patrol, education, resource protection, 
outreach, and we need people out there contacting the public. And that doesn't translate into crime statistics, I know, but it's very important. Thank you for your time. I have a quick question, Mr. Font, if I could. Yes. Um, thank you for, for uh, your longtime support of open space and in many capacities. Um, so the history of the open space patrols, it was original, originally, uh, if I re remember correctly, was independent or quasi-independent from the rest of APD, was it not? Yes, sir. We started the program in 1985 by hiring some fully sworn officers and it grew uh, to 18 full-time officer positions in 2004 when it was transferred to APD. Right, so that was an administrative decision, I suppose, of the mayor and yes, police mayor Travis at, that, at that time, yeah. Correct. All right, thanks. Just wanted to add that clarification for folks who didn't remember that, including myself. Well, I, I remember it, I just couldn't remember the time. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Peggy Norton, followed by Sarah Keeney. I'm Peggy Norton, and I have three unrelated comments, and I did send them to all the counselors. I support continuing free transit without having to go through passes. Um, after reading about $30 million being allocated to the rail yard sawmill trail, I'd like to encourage finding the money to complete the Alameda drain trail. The contract was signed six years ago and the county has finished theirs. Hearing rumor of disbanding the open space police force, I support continuing the function and expanding the numbers beyond five. I use the Bosque area daily, feel safe there, and notice few problems, and I think that is due to their presence. There might be other options. I think we would have more problems without their presence. There might be other options, such as expanding the open space budget to move the responsibility over to them. I've, otherwise, I fear these rural open space areas will get ignored. Sarah Keeney, followed by Christopher Ramirez. Christopher Ramirez, followed by Ann Lynn Hall. Good evening, President and City Councilors. My name is Christopher Ramirez, and I am speaking tonight as a former member and chair of the City's Transit Advisory Board and current executive director of Together for Brothers and the Albuquerque Bus Riders Union. Last month, the city's transit advisory board passed our fifth I'm resolution since 2019 in support of affordable and ideally free transit or zero fares. The resolution outlines the information from ABQ Rides onboard survey, where a vast majority of bus riders support the continuation of zero fares, as well as the understanding that the majority of bus riders identify as low income, making less than $25,000 annually per household, and also not possessing a driver's license. In addition, Together for Brothers has organized since October 2021 a transit equity and community safety working group, which changed to the Albuquerque Bus Riders Union in January 2022 and affiliated with the Transit Riders of the United States together and 30 other transit rider organizations across the country in monthly meetings and outreach at buses and on bus stops. Mr. President, please, may I speak? I was muted before. This is Sarah Keeney. Sarah Keeney, followed by Ann Lynn Hall. Thank you very much, Mr. President and counselors. Um, this, I'm here to speak from a statement that was passed yesterday by the Albuquerque Monthly Meeting of the Religious Society of Friends, uh, Quakers. And we are very concerned that sweeps of unhoused people are destroying personal property, exposing people to harsh conditions in the winter, creating an immoral, inhumane position in our city for unhoused people. There are alternatives, and one of them is safe outdoor spaces. I plea all the 
counselors to keep safe outdoor spaces in the IDO. We could also broaden, broaden the concept of respite care at Gateway. We could expand the hotel voucher program. We could do a similar program to Houston, implementing regular visits to outdoor shelter sites. Let's begin constructive alternatives to sweeps. Thank you. And Lynn Hall, followed by Xavier Barraza. Good evening, Mr. President and counselors. My name is Ann Lynn Hall and I am the CEO of Prosperity Works. Prosperity Works has a mission of helping the Mexicans achieve economic prosperity. And part of our work is protecting assets. I am here tonight to support the passage of ordinance 22-53, the tax preparer and consumer rights ordinance. I served on a team that helped review and provide guidance on critical points of this ordinance. This is a good compromise that protects taxpayers in Albuquerque while also addressing industry concerns about the ordinance that was passed in February of 2021. Consumers deserve to know how much they are going to pay for services with no hidden fees. They deserve to know if the person preparing their taxes is qualified to do their return. They deserve to have their return prepared accurately and honestly and they deserve pathways for recourse when something goes wrong. Thank you for your action tonight for supporting this important consumer protection issue, or it's 2253 introduced with no amendments. Xavier Barraza followed by Carl Holm. Thank you, uh, City, Council, City Council President, uh, Council Members, Xavier Barraza here with Rosa Rodinez Institute. I did hear now that the Zero fares is being taken off the agenda. I'm not sure if it's because of the um, review of the recent report that went out and um, how there was a lot of um, challenges with the plan of changing zero fares the way it is. Um, but uh, it is important that we keep it simple, um, which it is now. It's serving us. I can't imagine the data we're not collecting or don't have on the impacts it had during the pandemic. Um, it probably was one of our major savers for a lot of people in our city um, and we can't prove it unfortunately even though that that is and i know a lot of organizations like t for b and others are working to prove that um and then i think the other you know message for myself to to yourself council president and city councilors and those who are listening through you um is that the city is best governed by the people and i hope that we can continue to look at ways to engage folks on the city council so that we can uh better take action on the offerings of what each of us are bringing. There's some really great ideas that come from the people here in our city. Carl Holm, followed by Jeannie Allen. Jeannie Allen, followed by Carl Holm. Hi, can you hear me okay? I'll go ahead. I I live near the Bosque in the North Valley and I'm president of a volunteer citizens group, Friends of Condelario Nature Preserve, which has 65 members from across the city. And I would like to express strong support for retaining the Open Space Division's police because of their knowledge of the unique challenges of protecting the city's open spaces and residents. They have responded to special situations with fires, injured missing people, people with weapons, and we need their intimate knowledge of our open spaces. They're an important asset to the city. So thank you very much. Carl Paul. Good evening, uh, City Council President Benton and fellow councilors. I'm the executive director for GALA, which is the hotel association, and here to speak on behalf of the organization of hotels and tourism partners in support of the following two ordinances. The first one is 023233, uh, which is the integrated development ordinance to remove all references to the safe outdoor spaces. We feel as an organization that we do support the city and are empathetic towards the efforts to manage the homelessness crisis. But due to, the, to lack of, I think, uh, specifics, we feel that it needs to be removed from the IDO because right now it would allow the SOS to pop up without public notice or hearings. Uh, the second amendment is 02248, which is uh, amending chapter five, article five of the revised ordinances of Albuquerque, the public purchase ordinance relating to the exemptions of competitive requirements of the code. And that's regarding visit Albuquerque. 
I'm in support of that. We are as an organization in support of the ordinance and we hope that you do support it as well. Thank you. Mr. President, that concludes general public comment. Thank you, Mr. Kwan, now yes. And we'll get back to <clears throat> All right, we're now at the question and answer period. Counselors, any question for the administration? Uh, Councillor Sanchez. Um, excuse me, sorry. Uh, we have several people here who are signed up but haven't spoken yet for public comment. What is your name, sir? Um, we have several people. So I'm Benjamin Imbus, Angelina Crowley. Maybe that's it. Mr. Cornelius, are, are those folks signed up? Mr. Mr. President, uh, we do have uh, Mr. Imbus. I believe we skipped him because he was not in the room uh, when his name came up. However, the other speaker is not on our list. You signed up for an item later. She oh. signed up for an item later on the agenda, though. All right, uh, Mr. Ennis, why don't you go ahead? Uh, Thank you so much. Um, I want to speak tonight against qualified immunity. The argument I hear in favor of it is that we do not have enough police officers to do all the jobs we're asking them to do, and that qualified immunity will attract more. Um, first, I'd argue that if we're attracting officers by reducing accountability, these aren't the type of people we want on the police force. Second, um, cities that do have qualified immunity still have shortages, so this is a non-solution anyway. Third, not having enough police officers speaks to the fact that we're asking police officers to solve every problem of our city, which doesn't make sense. Homelessness should be responded to with social service and housing accessibility. Drug addiction, that's a medical issue. Youth petty crime, that's really an issue of we need community programs and after school programs. Um, welfare checks, those should be responded to with social workers. So I really just want to emphasize qualified immunity is not a real solution. It raises more problems than it resolves. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Council, President, any questions for the administration? Yes, Mr. President, I'm still waiting. Are we okay. clear? Mr. Sanchez, yes. Yes, I have a question for uh, Mr. Rael. Um, and I'd just like to ask Mr. Rael a question. I think Mr. Rael and I have been um, with the city for a long time. Um, I've been around the city for close to 30 years. Same as Mr. Rael, we go way back. Um, is that correct, Mr. Rao? Councilor, Council President uh, Benton and Councilor Sanchez, Mr. Rao is on vacation this week. He would be back on Thursday. Uh, if there is a question I can help you with, I would be happy to answer your question. If you can tell me what's the question. Well, the question I have for Mr. Rao is, is um, you know, we've been on for a long time, him and I. And I have never seen um, the carnage that we're facing here in Albuquerque with the homicide rate. And um, that is basically the question that, uh, that I'm dealing with is, is I wanted to ask, um, 
what are we going to be doing with the record homicide rate? We have a high number of women murdered. Um, it's extremely concerning to me. We also have a large number of homeless murdered. The crisis is impacting every individual um, that resides or visits Albuquerque. Um, so I just wanted to ask Mr. Rael what the mayor's plan is in reference to dealing with this um, horrific uh, murder record. Um, we shouldn't let, let it overshadow also the explosion of property crimes and the business owners and the homes that are being damaged and destroyed, the drug deal dealers that are on the street, human feces, urine, everything that, that we're having to deal with um, on the street. So those are the issues that I wanted to ask Mr. Rael what the chief's plan, I mean, the mayor's plans are in order to deal with this situation. Thank you. Council President Benton and uh, Councilor uh, Sanchez, uh, as you are aware, uh, mayor's initiative to tackle the crime is the MCI, which we have been talking uh, to councilors as well as public. Uh, I'll be happy to pass on your message to Mr. Ryle and when he comes back, he can schedule a meeting with you. But meanwhile, uh, Chief Medina is also here. And I, if, if you don't mind, I would like Mr. Uh, Chief Medina to sort of uh, weigh in. President Benton, uh, Councillor Sanchez, uh, you know, uh, homicides are very uh, complicated. We know that we're not the only city seeing this, but we also know that there's a variety of reasons why we're seeing an increase in homicides. Whether it's the fact that uh, we have uh, individuals who have uh, mental health uh, conditions uh, at a higher rate than it seems than ever before. Uh, we have individuals with substance abuse problems. We have a group of young adults that uh, have very little conflict resolution skills and minor incidents end up being homicides. And we have uh, a community that the last statistic I saw nationally was the number of individuals carrying a firearm has quadrupled since the pandemic. And when you add alcohol and substance abuse to some of those factors, uh, it's no wonder that we have seen a sharp increase in, in homicides. We need the Metro Crime Initiative to help us get mental health resources to, to as many individuals that need them as possible. We need to work together with the state legislature. We need to figure out how we're going to deal with individuals who are deemed uh, incompetent to stand trial and how we're gonna get them the help and the resources they need. Uh, a lot of our crime numbers are down as we all know over the past uh, five years, uh, we released those statistics recently. Uh, crime uh, is kind of flat this year, it's homicides, but we are, we did reach the same number of homicides. Uh, well, we are above, but that number is capable of fluctuating at any time because any other case could be deemed homicide. But for the most part, we're flat. Uh, we've seen a little reduction in violent crime, but until we fix some of these societal problems, uh, we're gonna continue to see crime. Uh, our officers every day, contrary to what anybody may think, our officers every day arrest people over and over again. We can't keep them in custody. Uh, we are taking the initiative to make some of our own outcomes better. And in that, uh, we've just assigned uh, an outsider who came to the Albuquerque Police Department but had a great knowledge of the courts. Our Deputy Commander Kyle Hartsock has been reassigned and he's going to work with us on a project that we call, and this is very new because mo nobody's heard this, but uh, we're gonna, he's going to help work and we're going to try to increase the amount of detention cases that we're hearing. The DA's office, I think the last estimate was about 20% of the time they, or less, they asked for detention on an individual who is, is uh, qualified for. We're gonna use the SHIELD unit we built in 2018 to increase the amount of times that we ask for detention and hopefully build better cases. City Attorney's Office is assisting me and we've identified five repeat offenders who are, have been deemed incompetent. And we're gonna try to set up hearings and push hearings forward for for civilly us to be able to see if we can't uh, get these individuals to the forced resources that they need uh, for mental health because they are a danger to the community. Uh, we need to get more officers on the street. Since you and I came to this department, officers have been responsible for officer prosecuted misdemeanor cases. And you and I both know that 75% of the time we showed up to the courthouse and we pled with that individual to 90 days deferred comp, I mean deferred uh, sentence. Uh, we are working 
to get an attorney to do this earlier in the process with the public defender's office and reduce the amount of time that our officers spending in court. So I think that there is not just one thing that needs to be done. There are several things that need to be done. Uh, APD is taking ownership that we need to conduct better investigations and clear more cases. We're doing so. APD is committed to get as many resources and resources on the ground to fight crime. We will continue to do so. APD has increased traffic citations, which sometimes results in felony arrests for warrants. We will continue to do so. There is not one solution, and there's not just one entity that needs to bring a solution to the table. We need the state legislature to assist us with funding. We need to rebuild mental health capacity within the state of New Mexico. We need to make sure that when somebody asks to get substance abuse help, that there's a bed immediately available for them because we all know that window of time is very short. And one day later, they may not want to get that help anymore. So there's a lot of things, but I think the biggest thing to remember is the mayor did develop the Metro Crime Initiative. And this is about bringing all the key stakeholders together, <clears throat> us working together to try to get answers to some of these problems. Thank you. Also, um, what I'm looking at too is, is even though Metro Crime Initiative is out there, what is the specifics of Metro Crime, Crime Initiative? What it does it exactly do? And what will the matrix be in order to make sure that there's accountability in reference to that Metro Crime Initiative? Um, if you can give me a whole breakdown as to what you're taking ownership of in reference to the Metro Crime Initiative, I would really appreciate it. Because there's a lot of a lot of points that I can think of that needs to be addressed in reference to that. So, what specifically are you, as a police chief, going to be doing in reference to the Metro Crime Initiative, and how do we have the accountability to make sure that you are getting it done and completing what you said you needed to do? President. Uh... Benton, Councillor Sanchez, uh, the first crime in Mexico crime initiative concluded last year. Uh, uh, I will ensure that you're emailed uh, the 40 points that the administration wanted to complete with the first Metro crime initiative. Uh, we did legislatively go uh, and we may talk about how we're going to hold the chief accountable for the Metro crime initiative and what has gotten done. Uh, quite honestly, you can't because not everything is within the chief's power last year. I tried to uh, revamp and I went to the legislature and asked that we make changes to our pre-detention hearing process. The state legislature didn't pass it. That is not the chief of police's fault. Uh, that is not the city of Albuquerque's fault. Uh, we need assistance from our state legislature to push some of these initiatives forward that we need to. We need to find common ground. I don't think everybody needs to stay in jail. I think violent people need to stay in jail. But in order for me to fully say that sentence, I also know that I need to have the resources to send somebody to substance abuse. Uh, one of the things we are going to ask for is we are going to ask for some updates. Uh, we're going to ask the state, the, the, the LFC, the Legislative Finance Committee, take a look at our criminal justice system as a whole. Uh, that is a, a letter that we're working to develop in the next few months is, I want to know, does the Public Defender's Office have all the resources it needs? Does, District court have all the resources it needs. Does the DA's office, I think we need a comprehensive report and that's where it starts is where are their gaps in our processes, but they're not just city of Albuquerque processes. Time and time again, I hear individuals say, what's the city of Albuquerque gonna do? My biggest struggles aren't what the city of Albuquerque is gonna do. I have a lot of confidence in, in our ability to get things through counselor, counsel. I think there's nine counselors uh, in the city of Albuquerque right now that want to lower crime. You tell me what law you can supersede from the state and pass that would enable us to go over some of our, our, our obstacles. There's none. You guys, council does not have the authority to do that. We have to work together. We have to advocate the state, the state legislature to come. We need all parties to participate. And that's what the Metro Crime Initiative is, it, it has been doing. And we'll get those that flyer with the 41st points out to you uh, today or, or tomorrow. Okay, so when you're talking about those 40 points um, and this problem, this Metro Crime Initiative has already started last year. We have not seen any difference or any change in, in the homicides. We actually grew in homicides and less officers 
during the Metro Crime Initiative. So in my opinion, the Metro Crime Initiative has not shown sign, any signs of success. So um, that's my point. So hopefully if you can start putting something together that shows signs of, of success and give me and the rest of the council um, your accountability matrix and hold yourself accountable, then, then we'll see how we go from there because right now I am, the, the city suffering. The city is suffering, you're at the helm of the police department and it's your responsibility to make sure that the issues that we're seeing with, with the crime in Albuquerque gets, it gets taken care of and reduced. That's what the chief does. The chief's job is to make sure that you lower the crime and raise the officers uh, and the population of officers. That's the primary goal of the police department. The backbone of the agency is Field Services Bureau. And that's exactly where we need the officers. By the way, did you get me that number yet? Council President Benton, uh, Councilor Sanchez, I'll check to see if dispatch has mailed it to you. I believe dispatch told me if they were correct, there were over 20 units working both the Southwest and the Northwest as of 1742 hours uh, when you asked about it. And, uh, you know, one of the things to think about with this administration and with this mayor, uh, crimes against a person, uh, 2018, 7,634. Crimes against a person, 2022, and those are year-to-date numbers, 6,053. There is a big improvement in crimes against a person. We could have a briefing with you anytime you'd like to sit down and have a coffee and talk about what our true crime statistics are. Uh, I don't know how to drill it into the community more. Crime is down from 2018, and uh, we have the numbers to show it. So whenever you're ready to sit down and talk about it, let me know. The homicide rate is still at the highest it's ever been in the city of Albuquerque. Thank you. Thanks, other questions for the administration? If you're not seeing me acknowledge you, just wave please, because I'm having a hard time with the interface here. Okay, uh, if there are no other questions for the administration, we'll move on to communications and introductions. Are there any changes to the letter of introduction? I have one, I move the rules be suspended for the purpose of pulling EC 165 out of Finance Government Operations Committee and placing on tonight's agenda for action. EC 165 is authorization to supplement a professional technical agreement with Engender Incorporated to provide substance abuse treatment. This will require a two thirds vote on the rule suspension. I, I move uh, the rules be suspended. And I see a second from Council Dasan, thank you. And Ms. Inosa-Ajos will go to a vote. Councilor Hassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Fieberton. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. I passed the analysis. All right, thank you. And I uh, neglected to uh, uh, do the approval of the journal. Uh, Vice President Lewis. Vice President, I move approval of the November 21st journal. Hmm. There's a motion, a second from Councillor Feeblecorn. Let's go to a vote. Councillor Bassam. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councilor Brown. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. That's unanimous. Thank you. Back to communications and introductions. I move the rules be suspended for purpose of pulling EC 187 out of FGO committee and place you on tonight's agenda for action. EC 187 is approving an agreement with Jaramillo Law Firm PC to provide legislative and lobbying services uh, at the session. The Councilor Hassan is a second, thank you. We'll go to a vote. This again is a two thirds majority required. Councilor Hassan. 
Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Peeblecorn. Yes. Councillor Grout. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Lewis. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, I move rules be suspended for the purpose of pulling EC 195 out of FGO and place it on tonight's agenda for action. EC 195 is a lease agreement between First Choice Community Healthcare and the city of Albuquerque at 6900 Gonzales Road Southwest. Second, Councilor Bassan, thank you. We'll go to a vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Peeblecorn. Yes. Councillor Grout. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Lewis. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. That passes unanimously. Thank you. I move the rules be suspended for the purpose of pulling R87 out of FGO and placing it on tonight's agenda for action. R87 is approving an award from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development for Community Development Block Grant CARES Act funding and an award from the state of New Mexico beginning in fiscal year 2023. Thank you, Councilor Bassan. With that second, we'll go to a vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Council Peeblecorn. Yes. Council Grout. Yes. Council Jones. Yes. Council Lewis. Yes. Council Pena. Yes. Council Sanchez. Yes. Council Benton. Yes. This is unanimously. Thank you. I'll pay, make a motion to pull EC-177 out of FGO and place it on January 4th agenda for action. EC-177 is approval of the Route 66 Flats Development Agreement for rental housing and high desert housing to utilize workforce housing trust funds towards new construction of a permanent supportive housing project. This requires a simple majority. And a second for Council Fiebelkorn, thank you. Move to a vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Passes unanimously. Thank you. I moved to pull EC-178 out of FGO and place it on the January 4th agenda for action. EC-178 is approval of the Knotts Landing Court 60th Street Development Agreement for rental housing with Albuquerque Housing Authority to utilize workforce housing trust funds toward the rehabilitation and new construction of a public housing project. And is there a second? Second, Councilor Feeblecorn. And this is a simple majority to move this to the fourth. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Fiebelkorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. Passes unanimously. <clears throat> Councillor Davis. Thank you, Mr. President. I make a motion to pull 058 out of FGO and place it on the January 4th agenda, uh, council agenda for action. 058 approves a project involving universal hydrogen to manufacture modular fueling cap capsules and uh, assemble hydrogen fuel powertrains and other technical things I don't understand and repeal all the actions inconsistent with this ordinance. And the second from Councilor Bassan. We'll go to a vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. 
Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Fubelcorn. No. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Benton. No. This passes on a 7 2 vote. Thank you. I move the rules to be suspended for the purpose of placing 190, EC 197 on tonight's agenda for action. EC 197 is approving an agreement with Thompson Consulting LLC to provide legislative and lobbying services for the city. Uh, this is a vote on a rule suspension requiring two thirds vote. And a second from Councilor Feeblecorn. Thank you. Move to a vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. That passes unanimously. I move the rules to be suspended for the purpose of placing EC 200 on tonight's agenda for action. EC 200 is supplement number 11 to the lease between the city of Albuquerque and the United States Air Force. This is a rule suspension requiring a two thirds vote. There's a second from Councilor Bassan and we'll go to a vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Passes unanimously. I move the rules be suspended for the purpose of placing EC 198 on tonight's agenda for action. EC 198 is the mayor's recommendation of award to David Campbell, attorney at law, LLC, for development hearing officer. And there's a second from Councilor Fablecorn. Thanks. This again requires a two thirds vote. Ms. Eno House. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Passes unanimously. Councilors Pena, Feeblecorn, and Bassan. Uh, Mr. Mr. President, I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of placing R89 on tonight's agenda for action. R89 is establishing legislative and budget priorities for the city of Albuquerque for the first session of the 56th New Mexico State Legislature. And there's a second from Councilor Feeblecorn. Missy you knows to call the vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. That passes unanimously. Councilor Pena, Feeble Corn, and Bassan again. Uh, Mr. President, I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of introducing R90 and placing it on the January 4th Council agenda for action. R90 is establishing federal programming and policy priorities for the city of Albuquerque for federal fiscal years 2023 and 2024. And there's a second from Councilor Bassan. We'll go to a vote, Ms. Hinojos. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. 
Councilor Benton. Yes. Passes unanimously. Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, I have a quick question about the next agenda item, R R91. If we yes. were to refer to the, I mean, we just moved a whole bunch of items off of FGO onto tonight's agenda or onto January. So I'm wondering, is this going to end up being the only agenda item that we put on FGO or shall we? I just don't wanna necessarily put us in a bind where we can put it in January or we're good. I see Councilor Davis shaking his head that we're. Uh, well, Mr. President, I'll defer, to the, I'll defer to the clerk, but I think we had uh, over 20 items on FGO. I think we've only okay. removed or, or moved less than 10. So we still have an agenda. I think this takes care of the big ticket items that would need to be adjusted, but we certainly need to be ready, uh, I think, for the January meetings of the council, since anything we do in January wouldn't come to us till February. But we'll talk with the clerk and see if there's a need for that meeting. If we don't need to have a meeting, I promise you we're not going to have it. No, thank you for the clarification. I just wanted to make sure that we still I and the refresher for what what's on the upcoming agenda. So with that, um, I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of introducing R91 and referring to the Finance and Government Operations Committee. R91 is adjusting fiscal year 2022 appropriations for certain funds and programs to provide for actual expenditures, adjusting fiscal year 2023 operating appropriations and appropriating capital funds. And you have a second from Council <laughs> Fieber-Corn. Again, this requires a two-thirds vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Fieber-Corn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. This passes unanimously. And now, Mr. President, we'll need a motion to accept the letter as amended. Okay, so um, I will move uh, acceptance of the letter of introduction as amended. Second. Is that correct? And there's a second from Councilor Bassan. Any other discussion? Let's move to a vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Peeblecorn. Yes. Councilor Grouch. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. That passes unanimously. All right, we have no reports from committees tonight. We will move to deferrals and withdrawals. Councilors, any deferrals or withdrawals at this time? Starting with deferrals from final actions, Councilor Pena. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I R70 is requiring a transit system security incident response tactical plan quarterly reporting of security calls for in-service in, in the transit system and the development of a long-term security plan for the operations and facilities of the Albuquerque Transit Department. I move a, a deferral to January 4th. We have a second from Councilor Passan. Go to a vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Fiebelkorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. <laughs> yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. That passes unanimously. Okay, we now move to our consent agenda. Are there any changes to the consent agenda, councilors? Don't see any hands jumping out forward. Um, we will uh, thank the individuals on tonight's consent agenda who are being appointed to serve on boards or commissions. 
We appreciate your willingness to serve the city. Vice President Lewis. Move approval. There's a motion for approval of the consent agenda and a second from Councillor Grout. We'll go to a vote. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councillor Grout. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Lewis. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. Passes unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Hinojos. We now have our announcements. Councillor Davis. Mr. President, there will be an FGO meeting, maybe, on Monday, December 12th at 5 p.m. on Zoom. Councillor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. There will be a public safety committee meeting on Tuesday, December 13th at 5 p.m. via Zoom video conference. Thank you. And Councillor Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. The Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee meeting scheduled for Wednesday, December 14th is canceled. Thank you. And the council meeting scheduled for December 19th is canceled. We'll now go to, we have no public hearings tonight. We'll now move on to approvals. Uh, starting with item A, PC 165, authorization to supplement a professional technical agreement with Engender Incorporated to, pro to provide substance abuse treatment. I move approval. Second from Councilor Bassan, thank you. Is there anyone signed up to speak? No, there is not. All right. We will go to, if there are no further questions, we'll go to a vote on this substance abuse treatment contract. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Peeblecorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Benton. <laughs> yes. That passes unanimously. Next is EC 187. This is approving an agreement with Jaramillo Law Firm PC to provide legislative and lobbying services. I move approval. Second from Council of the Sun. And if there are no comments or questions or anyone signed up to speak, we'll go to a vote, Ms. Jones. Council of the Sun. Yes. Council Davis. Yes. Council of Peeblecorn. Yes. Council of Grout. Yes. Council of Jones. Yes. Councillor Lewis. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. It passes unanimously. And did I skip? Next is uh, EC 195. This is the first choice community health care in the city of Albuquerque at 6900 Gonzales Road, Southwest lease agreement. I move approval. And second, Councilor Sanchez, thank you. And we'll go to a vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Peeblecorn. Yes. Councilor Grepp. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Councilor Lewis. Councilor Pena. Yeah, that's yes. Yes. Sorry. Oh, thank you. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. That passes unanimously. Right, next is EC-197, approving agreement with Thompson Consulting LLC to provide legislative and lobbying services for the city. I move approval. Second from Councillor Peeblecorn. Thank you. Yeah. No comments, we'll go to a vote. Ms. Hinojos. 
Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Fiebelkorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Councilor Pena. Councilor yes. Sanchez. Oh, thank you. Councilor Sanchez? Yes. Councilor Benton? Yes. That passes unanimously. Next is EC 198, the mayor's recommendation of award to David Campbell, attorney at law, LLC, for development hearing officer. I move approval. I see a second from Councilor Grout. Thank you, Councilor. And I see Mr. Campbell available here for any questions that any of you counselors may have. As, as we always used to say, Mr. Campbell of 6500 Uptown Boulevard, I believe it was, maybe it was 6400. I remember that distinctly back in the day. All right. Uh, any questions for Mr. Campbell, Councilor, Councilor Bassan? Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and it's not necessarily for Mr. Campbell himself. I have no uh, qualms about this appointment. I do want to ask, perhaps it's in R91, but do we have an identified funding source to make this if we pass it right away? Since I believe it says that there's going to be about $80,000 due by the end of this year. Mr. President, Councillor Basson, uh, the documentation that came down with the EC did indicate that there was not currently a uh, budget allocated for this position for the rest of this fiscal year or for the next two fiscal years that this contract will be in place. Um, if Director Varela is in the mayor's conference room, I can't quite make out who all is in there. He might be able to better speak to how they will be funding this contract in the near term. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Council President uh, Benton and uh, Councillor Bassant, that is a great question. Uh, as you know, the amendment to the IDO, uh, which takes effect on 1225 of this year, was uh, uh, passed in July. So it was well after the uh, budget for this year was developed. And so this was an unfunded, uh, but well supported, we think, from a uh, practical standpoint, the uh, amendment proposed by City Council. And so at this point, it looks like uh, we will have to shuffle funds around and uh, perhaps use some vacancy savings in order to cover uh, some money, unless there is an appropriation from council uh, for many sources you may have to help us cover the remainder of this year. The next several months will be an experiment to determine what the actual costs are. We were very conservative on the high side of coming up with an estimate of we thought the, uh, the funds may be. Uh, we probably were overly aggressive in coming up with that number uh, because we were looking at the former caseloads that the DRB Development Review Board used to handle, but the caseload for the development hearing officer is actually going to be quite a bit smaller because the amendment also to the IDO also narrowed the scope of work that the hearing officer is going to hear. So uh, we're confident that um, the expenditures will prove less than what we, we estimated but at this point, we don't have exact numbers and no, this did not come from council with funding. Uh, director, thank you for that. I I don't know if you really want one of the counselors to come in and figure out where that funding is gonna come from. But uh, at the same time, Mr. Campbell, I am sure that at least the vacancy savings is somewhere that we can start with, uh, but way to take a leap of faith on shuffling these funds uh, but I do, I do know that we will probably be able to pull it off, but it is something that I, I look forward to us doing sooner than later. And I'm sure we all agree. Councilor Davis. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. And I, uh, I echo Councilor Bassan's uh, uh, concerns there. So I, I might ask our staff and, and Director Varela, if you would sort of get together and let's look at mid-year cleanup. And if not, if someone will prepare a resolution um, to make the appropriate appropriation to at least get us through the end of the year. I think this is something council has designated. It's important. Um, let's not shortcut uh, or shortchange some of the other important programs at planning that we need. We're way short on vacancies. We have big vacancies over there and, um, and certainly probably have some savings, but uh, 
but we need to fill those positions. Um, and so I hope our staff can help us. And I'd love to see a resolution to do that if we don't, if we can't get it into mid-year cleanup at some point. Uh, Mr. President, I just, I know Mr. Campbell has an answer for this, so I'll put him on the spot just so we're clear. Uh, Mr. Campbell's done some really great work uh, at Mesa del Sol over the last few years and a number of, uh, a lot of that work has been around development uh, where he knows uh, a thing or two around getting around city hall uh, and subdivisions. Uh, but Mr. Campbell, if I may ask, it's my understanding um, that if the any developments that you've had a prior engagement with, you have a, a process or you've come to an agreement with the planning department to recuse yourself and that they would find some other uh, hearing officer for those. I, I don't know that there are any more pending, but I know you've been involved in several in the past that may come back to us. Uh, Mr. President, Councilor Davis, yes, that's the case. In fact, this proposal that was made that was recommended to you uh, includes not only myself, but engineer, civil engineer, Ron Bohannon with Tira West. And we are proposing to um, be sort of dual hearing officers so that we can avoid uh, any conflicts whatsoever as between the two of us. Uh, and so there will be times that Mr. Bohannon will, will handle the hearings and other times that I will be handling the hearings. But we really did propose this as a duo um, and I believe Mr. Bohannon is on. I don't see him on the screen right now, but I know that he's uh, in attendance. Yeah, and Mr. President, that's not required. I just wanted to get it on the record. I knew Mr. Campbell had an answer and uh, we <laughs> wanted to be sure that we were putting that out front so there's no miscommunication or misunderstanding. Fully support this. I think it's a great idea. and hope that uh, we'll come back and continue to fund this before Mr. Campbell sends us his first very big bill. Thank you. I see Mr. Bohannon there. Uh, any questions for him or give him a chance to speak briefly if you like. No, Mr. President, thank you. Um, David and I have thought this through pretty well. We've been working with staff on some of the protocol and a lot of the rules moving forward with the DHO. Um, we both think that uh, we can uh, contribute back to the community that's been so gracious to provide us uh, employment opportunities for our for our lives as well. So we hope to return the favor to the city. Thank you. All right. Any other questions or comments, counselors? There's a motion and a second for approval of EC 198. And is there anyone signed up to speak on this topic? I see Councillor Sanchez may have his hand raised. Do you have your hand raised, Councillor? No. Okay. Uh, great. And and you, Councillor Grab, you, the folks will cross the top of my screen for whatever. I can't see your hands. Please. No. Okay. Uh, all right. Then we'll go to a vote. Ms. Hinojos. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councillor Grout. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Lewis. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. Councillor Binton. Yes. It passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Campbell, Ms. Bohannon. We'll see you out there in the, in the hustings or whatever they Thank call you. it. Thank you. Um, next is EC 200, supplement number 11 to the lease between the city and the United States Air Force. I move approval. And Councilor Sanchez, thanks for the second. And uh, is there anyone signed up to speak on this? No, there's not. And uh, any questions, Councillor, with regard to this? This is uh, an ongoing lease between the city and the USAF for the use of the runways at Kirtland and uh, Albuquerque International. I don't see any questions. So uh, did I move approval? <laughs> Help me out. <laughs> I think I did move approval and it was seconded. So thank you, and um, we'll move to a vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Peeblecorn. Yes. 
Councillor Grout. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Lewis. Councillor Lewis? Yes. Thank you. Councillor Pena. Councillor Pena? Yes. Thank you. Councillor Sanchez? Yes. Councillor Benton? Yes. Passes unanimously. All right. Uh, let's see. Councillors, it's uh, 737. What's your pleasure? 20 minute break or keep pounding through? I see a thumbs up at least one for a 20 minute break. Y'all okay with that? Yep. All right. So we will return in about 20 minutes. Thank you.
All right, we are back from our break. We are now on final actions. And we'll start with Councilor Bassan, 033. Mr. President, 033 is amending section 14 through 16 of the Integrated Development Ordinance to remove all references to safe outdoor spaces. I move it do pass. A second from Councilor Sanchez. And do we have folks signed up to speak? Mr. President, yes, we have seven people signed up. To... All right, why don't we get started with hearing our public comment. Again, our, this first, is... our first speaker is Tina Kitchell, followed by Karen Navarro. Good evening, Council. My name is, uh, should I go? Uh, yeah, just, I'm sorry. As a reminder, we're uh, unfortunately having to limit our comments to a minute tonight. So thank you. I'll try. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tina Cashel. I was thrilled to went last fall when the council approved the development of safe outdoor spaces. I'm now stunned that the council would consider effectively erasing the efforts of many residents to make that happen. In September, I visited a safe outdoor space site in Aurora, Colorado. That site is on one end of a parking lot owned by a church. It is well-fenced, well-maintained, and well-staffed with about 50 units. The site opened last January with tents and gradually added pallet shelters that are semi-permanently installed with heating and cooling in each unit. A shower truck visits the site several times a week. There are case managers available Monday through Friday, and the site itself is staffed 24 hours. They have a friendly agreement with the Aurora Police Department in the event a crisis intervention team is needed. There's also a fenced parking area for people living in cars. Since opening, a number of their residents have transitioned into permanent housing. This is one inspiring example of what can be done when we as a community pivot towards something new. Allowing safe outdoor spaces is a compassionate and effective alternative to the current practice of sweeping encampments. And I urge you to vote no on this ordinance. Thank you. Karen Navarro, followed by Carl Holm. Good evening, Councillors. Um, <clears throat> this bill would totally reverse the decisions you have already made. Why? Because of irate public feedback that was an overreaction. Prior to that, the bill sponsor was in agreement that we need a full continuum of approaches to homelessness. With all the complaining about human waste in parks and along streets, why would this council reverse a zoning change that would set aside land that is not next to a residential area that would provide sanitary facilities and an operator who meets the strict requirements established by you councilors at the last council meeting. As Tina mentioned in Aurora, Colorado, there is a successful safe outdoor space for 40 plus units run by Salvation Army. These residents were camping all around the city. Councilors, how about a trip to Aurora, Colorado to see a successful site before you consider taking this draconian step to eliminate safe outdoor spaces from the IDO. Thank you. Carl Holm, followed by Sarah Malone. Carl Holm, followed by Sarah Malone. Sarah Malone, followed by Rosemary Blanchard. Councillor Benton, other council members, keep safe outdoor spaces in the IDO. Homelessness is one of the chief complaints you hear about, along with the lack of affordable housing in a city where skyrocketing rents push even working people into homelessness. The determination of this body to include safe outdoor spaces in the IDO was the correct decision. Such spaces provide a safe place to leave one's belongings, meet service providers, find jobs and housing. I have given dozens of bags of warm clothing and blankets to the city's community safety group for distribution to folks living outdoors. Yet, as long as they live in unsanctioned camps, the unhoused, are subject to regular sweeps by the city, destroying these very life-saving supplies. As humankind, we must be both 
human and kind. Stop the sweeps and keep safe outdoor spaces in the ideal. Make this one Albuquerque for all. Rosemary Blanchard, followed by Andrea Calderon. President Benton, Councilor Bassan, City Council members. My name is Rosemary Blanchard. I'm a resident of District 2, and I live in the near North Valley of Albuquerque. Resolution 02233, which would remove all references to safe outdoor spaces from the IDO, is not only cruel, but ineffective in addressing the problem of homelessness in Albuquerque. Removing all reference to safe outdoor spaces in the IDO will not remove, reduce the problem of homelessness in our city. It will simply reduce the resources available to the city and to nonprofit organizations to provide alternatives to the current grim process of sweeping temporary sites of shelter and hounding unhoused persons from one site to another. Removing the ability of the IDO to incorporate and regulate self-outdoor spaces does not provide a viable alternative to the many temporary shelters unhoused persons are setting up each night to provide some shelter from the elements. Rather, this action will only continue the self-defeating practice of sweeping personal possessions, including identity documents that are necessary to help unhoused persons obtain services that might get them off the streets. Please vote no on this. Garrett, we have anyone else signed up? I'm I'm actually next on the list. I'm not sure if you want to start the timer, but I can start. Just a second. We're having a little technical problem. Hang with us there, Ms. Calderon. Hmm. Uh, we've got a technical issue. We're going to have to take a recess. Our We're back on, uh, Mr. President, we are back on. Sorry for the inconvenience there. Okay, you're back on. Very good. Thank you. Our last, uh, our last speaker on item 33 was uh, Rosemary Calderon. Yes. Ms. Calderon. Excuse me, Rosemary Blanchard. It's Andrea Calderon who'll be speaking now. My mistake. Thank you, Rosemary. Andrea Calderon. Great. Thank you. Um, so I am uh, calling for you to vote against uh, 02233. As you might know, there's a revolving door of incarceration um, and homelessness. Homelessness is a risk factor for incarceration. Over 15% of those in jail were homeless prior to incarceration, and the rate of at a rate of 7.5 to 11.3 times higher than the general adult population. Um, so now, as you know, the cost of incarceration is significant. Cleanup costs would continue to be expensive if they're not located in specific, if folks are not located in a specific area. Uh, several council meetings ago, the cost to solely clean up Coronado Park was stated at about $700,000, including departments of solid waste, APD, FCS, and ACS, um, to reduce the amount of debris associated with tent camping at that site. There's also costs of law enforcement, which would increase due to patrolling and overtime costs, which, as we know, are pretty significant and at $12 million um, for this upcoming budget. Um, and downstream responses are always at a greater uh, cost than upstream ones. So I, I highly encourage you to vote against the removal of uh, the IDO for, or for, of the SOS from the IDO. Thank you. And thank you for the extra seconds. Appreciate it. That concludes public comment, Mr. President. All right, thanks, folks, for working with us on our timetable tonight. Um, we're back on the bill, and uh, turn it over to Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, I I think that most of us know where we stand at this point. However, I just want to make sure to point out that since the passing of this original ordinance the, with the safe outdoor spaces, two have been approved. There's a potential for three more. So for those people that say we need to try something, I think that it's important to realize that we are going to indeed be trying something, being that two are going to happen at least, maybe up to five. So this is a way that we can, at this point, try safe outdoor spaces, and then also listen to the community and, and really what's 
an overwhelming majority of people who have continued to reach out uh, requesting that we don't proceed with this. Thank you, Councillor Lewis. Mr. President, yeah, just a just a comment um, about this. You know, after all this time, I I, I mean, you know, I, I, again, I don't think anything's changed as far as where we stand on this. But also, what's clear is the is is uh, that the community's um, uh, stance on this hasn't changed either. In in, uh, in my district, I don't know of any uh, neighborhood association uh, that agrees with safe outdoor spaces. I don't know of any neighborhood coalition that has supported safe outdoor spaces. In fact, they've all been very against it. And all of these are people that are very supportive of our shelters, of all of our programs, of the millions of dollars we put toward um, uh, housing vouchers. Um, I mean, uh, there's an incredible amount of support for the massive amount of money that we are uh, funding um, drug treatment um, and all of the homeless services that we have in our city. Uh, but this is something that uh, um, uh, that there is widespread um, just opposition to, and that really hasn't changed. And so, um, you know, Channel 7 did a, um, a report a few weeks ago that was pretty eye-opening when it comes to Denver. Um, and if we're headed toward where Denver is right now, as we've, we've held this up as the banner of, you know, what we want to be, uh, then we're going to be in trouble. Um, because there's more homelessness there than ever before, even after several years of uh, safe outdoor spaces. Um, the city of Denver has spent a massive amount of money specifically on safe outdoor spaces. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's been a failure there. Uh, in fact, um, uh, they were interviewing people. And when the you know, people there heard that Albuquerque might have a uh, you know, safe outdoor space for them, uh, there was a lot of interest in those areas for people to come here to Albuquerque and and take advantage of our safe outdoor spaces from out of state. And so, um, again, I think it's very clear that the people in my district, people around the city, the neighbor associations, the coalitions, the groups that you know we represent, just do not support this. Councilor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm not sure if you remember, but when this went way back. I guess in January when I was brought into committee, um, I actually suggested that uh, safe outdoor spaces didn't have any business being in the IDO. Um, we ended up running into issues over and over and over and over um, in reference to, to dealing with it. And, uh, and here we are a whole year later. And, um, and this, is, this is basically an amendment that, that I asked, actually asked for when it was in the, when it was commit in committee, uh, and um, and one of the things that I know as well is that um, my constituents and the people that are in my community do not support the uh, safe outdoor spaces project. Um, so, um, just wanted to give that tidbit of information. Thank you. Listening to the voters. Thank you, Councillor. Other councillors, would you like to comment? See any other hands raised? Please wave at me if you if I'm missing you. Um, I don't know if the administration wants to speak. I, I know that a lot of what's been said has been said. <laughs> and uh, thank you, oh, Councillor Benton. Yes. Thank thank you, Councillor Benton and fellow councillors. This is um, Carol Pierce, Director of Family and Community Services. I appreciate the conversation. I do believe as we've said um, all along that safe outdoor spaces, while not the, the one solution for homelessness, it is complemented by all that the council has supported for housing vouchers, for the shelter, for our gateway. And it's one slice of what can be done to really um, address encampments on our streets. I'm really glad that Councilor Lewis brought up the Channel 7 30 minute special. I thought it was a well-balanced report on what's possible with safe outdoor spaces that Denver reported, as well as um, a very realistic report. So um, 
I, I think it's a solution that we need here in Albuquerque. I do know our Albuquerque community is concerned about encampments on our streets, and this is one solution that can help um, by having safe outdoor spaces available. Thank you. All right, seeing no other hands, I'll turn it over to Councillor Bassan to close. I urge your support. Thank you, Councillor. We'll move to a vote on 033. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Davis. No. Councillor Feeblecorn. No. Councillor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones? No. Councilor Lewis? Yes. Councilor Lewis? Yes. Thank you. Right. Councilor Pena? Yes. Councilor Sanchez? Yes. Councilor Benton? No. That passes on a 5-4 vote. Thank you. We'll move now to item B. Councilors Davis, Pena, and Bassan, 039. Mr. President, 039 is uh, we have a committee substitute amending Chapter 2, Article 4 of the City Code relating to elections and petitions. I move it to pass. And there's a second from Councilor Davis. Um, and then you, you say you do have a committee sub. I'm sorry, this is no, it was already it was already oh, approved. Uh, so okay. if the administration so, and Mr. Watson wanted to speak on this, that would be great. Uh, otherwise, um, I leave it up to you and any questions. All right, thank you. And we appreciate everyone's been trying to work with uh, with uh, Mr. Watson and and uh, we continue to to uh, tweak these systems and, and try to make them better. I know that everyone that agrees with the need for that. Um, does the administration want to speak, Mr. Watson? Um, thank you, Council President and um, members of the Council for sponsoring this bill. We really have appreciated working with Council staff on this. Uh, it is an important cleanup to a number of provisions of our code. I'll stand for any questions the Council has, but um, I think it was well summarized in the staff analysis. Thank you. Councilors, any other discussion? Sponsors to close. I won't speak necessarily for my other sponsors, Mr. President, but I urge your support. I see a thumbs up from at least one other. So we'll move to a vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. <laughs> Councillor Davis? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Councillor Fewelcorn? Yes. Councillor Grout? Yes. Councillor Jones? No. Councillor Lewis? Yes. Councillor Pena? Yes. Councillor Sanchez? Yes. Councillor Benton? Yes. It passes on an eight to one vote. Thank you. Move to item C, this same sponsor, Councillor Davis Pena and Bassan, 040. Go for it, Councillor. Well, you did such a good job last time, I didn't want to break this up. Mr. President, 040 is the committee sub amending articles 12, 13, and 16 of the city charter relating to elections and public campaign financing. I move a due pass. Second from Councillor Bassan. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll make this very simple. Uh, this relates to public financing. Uh, it also relates to the Code of Ethics, uh, sort of clarifying and simplifying the way the Board of Ethics addresses um, complaints about violations and allows them to do um, certain audits of signatures, et cetera, to get ahead of some of the concerns that came out of the last election. All right. Any other questions or comments, counselors? Uh, Mr. Watson, would you like to comment? Um, Mr. President, members of the council, I'd like to thank council staff again for working with us on this. It was an important cleanup. Um, 
really does a lot of the improvements that we wanted to do in the in the charter and um I think these will be great, um, great revisions going into the next cycle. All right, thanks. Sponsors to close. Uh, Mr. President, I just might add that for counselors thinking about running next time or people watching to think they might want to do this, uh, this will make this process much easier on them next time. And so we encourage their support. All right, we'll go to a vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Mm -hmm. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Fubelcorn. Yes. Councillor Grout. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Lewis. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. That passes unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Hinojos. We'll go now to item D, Councilors Fabricorn, Pena, and Bassan, 041. Anyone want to take it? Thank you, Mr. President. Um, this is 041, amending the Intergovernmental Relations Ordinance to update Intergovernmental Relations Committee membership, the ability of the committee to convene, the intergovernmental coordination responsibilities of the committee, development of the federal and state priorities resolution, review of obligations, and we would do pass. I see a second from Councilor Bassan. I wanna thank uh, the three of the sponsors for, for their work on this uh, committee, but also on uh, getting this, this update in place. Mr. President, I would like to move a floor substitution. All right. In your iPads. <coughs> um, can I move forward with that, sir? Yes, please. All right, okay. so in your iPod, there is just a little bit of a cleanup um, it adds um, the word programming to the title. It's, uh, it sets forth rules for um, alternatives, uh, alternates for um, the other city councilors to participate. It removes the list of local government agencies um, and just says that we will liaise with federal, state, and local governments. It removes the procedures for amending the state and federal priorities resolution and instead says that we'll have a joint resolution and then we can also have individual counselors or the mayor um, propose additional um, priorities for themselves and it adds a requirement that the annual membership contract with the municipal league is to be submitted to the igr for approval um, so i move it to pass for that floor substitute and there's a second for Councilor Bassan on the floor sub <laughs> uh, any other discussion uh, on the, this will be on the substitution. The vote will, uh, will now occur. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Peeblecorn. Yes. Councilor mm -hmm. Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. That passes unanimously. All right, we're back on the bill as substituted. And uh, any discussion or uh, Councillor Bassan? Mr. President, I would like to move deferral as substituted to January 4th. There's a motion and a second, Councillor Davis, for uh, a deferral until our next meeting on January 4th. We have a discussion on the deferral. We'll go to a vote. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Fubelcorn. Yes. Councillor Grout. Yes. <clears throat> Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Lewis. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. That passes unanimously. Thank you. Next is item E, Councillors Bassan, Pena, and Davis, 045. Councillor Pena, you go. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. 045 is amending the code of uh, ethics relating to financial disclosures of elected officials. I move we do pass. But second from Councilor Bassan. And, uh, and further discussion. It, we're, we're powering through this stuff, but this is a pretty important piece of legislation here. And I really appreciate the three sponsors on, on uh, the code of the ethics is something we all have deal, dealt with uh, if we run for office, which we all have. <laughs> I'm pretty sure every single one of us at one time. Mr. Uh, President? Encountered. Yes. We do have one person signed up to speak. Okay. Let's hear from that person. Thank you, Mr. President, you. counselors. My name is Jeremy Ferris. I'm the director of New Mexico State Ethics Commission. I've reviewed this proposed ordinance, and it's, it's consistent with the American Law Institute's principles of government ethics. Um, in many ways, the passage of this ordinance would, would make Albuquerque a model in the area of financial disclosure law not only for other local governments in New Mexico, but for the state of New Mexico itself. And so I wanna thank the, the sponsors for this ordinance and, and for the administration for your work on it. Um, so thank you, Mr. President and Council. Thank you, Mr. Ferris, and thanks for sticking around with us and uh, appreciate your work. Other discussion, counselors? We do have a motion and a second from a due pass on 045. Uh, Councilor uh, uh, sponsors to close. Um, I would urge everyone's support, but I know that Ethan is uh, you know, on and I, you know, without his help and support and work on this as well. So Ethan, if you wanted just to say one last thing before we close. I, I would just thank all the sponsors for bringing this important legislation forward. This, um, I think there's room for our um, our disclosure laws to be more robust, and I, I think the council is doing a, a great thing here. So I, I look forward um, to um, more discussion on this. Thank you, and with that, Mr. President, I would urge everyone's support. Thank you, Council Pena. We'll go to a vote, Ms. Hinojos. Council Bassan. Yes. Council Davis. Yes. Councillor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councillor Grapp. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Lewis. Yes. Councillor Pena. <coughs> Councillor Pena? Yes. Thank you. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. And that passes unanimously. Thank you. Next is item F, Councillor Fable Porno 46. Thank you, Mr. President. This is repealing the City of Albuquerque Code of Ordinance Sections 2641 through 2646, the Records Analysis and Disposition Committee Ordinance, and replacing it with a new ordinance amending the existing open, existing open records ordinance sections 2761 through 2767, the Open Records Ordinance, repealing sections 2771 to 3, and we'll do pass. There's a motion and a second from Councilor Bassan. Anyone signed up to speak? Mr. President, we have one person signed up, but they are no longer with us on Zoom. Thank you, Mr. Cornelius. Uh, and again, Mr. Watson, I know he worked with us on this and appreciate his, his and his whole office's work on, on a lot of these. We're gonna have a lot smoother situation going forward, but you, would you like to comment briefly, uh, Ethan, on, on what this is about? Um, thank you, Council President, members of the Council, and um, thank you to Councilor Fiebelkorn for assisting us with this ordinance. Um, we are now receiving at the city over 10, uh, over 10,000 requests for public records every year. Uh, we do have a significant <laughs> staff dedicated to identify um, specific issues that need to be addressed. So thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion, counselors? If not, Councilor Fiebel, corn to close. 
Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to say, you know, this is a really important piece of legislation for me. I'm a big fan of the Inspection of Public Records Act. I want to make sure that we are able to maintain those IPRA requests and get them out to the public as needed. And this is really a cleanup and clarification that is really needed to make that process work. So I urge your support. Thank you. We'll go to a vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. <clears throat> Councilor Peebleclin. Yes. Councilor Grau. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. And that passes unanimously. Thank you. Now we're on item G, Councillor Pena and Lewis, 047. You wanna take this, Councillor Lewis? Sure, Mr. President. Um, we're uh, we're gonna, going to defer this bill, but um, we do have a, 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 a substitute. There's actually a second floor substitute. So I don't know if Tom's on, if Tom can give us a summary of the changes in that floor sub. Yes. <laughs> Um, Mr. President, members of the council, the floor substitute does a number of requests uh, from both the transit department and what we identified here in council office and what also a request from uh, Mr. Ramirez from the transit advisory, formerly of the transit advisory board. Um, the first request, uh, first of all, it does clean up some of the whereases. There were some concerns expressed the last meeting, so we've done clean, we've gone ahead and cleaned that up. Second, it adds in that there will be an equity analysis um, is in the bill and has been completed. That officially has not yet been completed. That's one of the main reasons for deferring the bill. Um, that hopefully will be completed by the Transit Department following Federal Transit Administration regulations by the end of the week. Um, at that point in time, we hope to post it for people to be able to look at. Um, the second item it does <clears throat> is that it makes it very, it clarifies that the very, that paratransit will be free, that the Sunban, uh, once somebody qualifies, goes through, goes through the qualification process for Sunban, that it will be a free ride. Um, they'll be able to use their, their Sunban pass or whatever they get as part of the qualification to get on board. Um, second, it also get, goes ahead and adds in any photo government ID can be used as a pass to get on, as a free pass to get on. That would include driver's licenses or other types of photo IDs. That allows uh, just somebody who, let's say, had to um, can't use their car for a couple of days to be able to go ahead and just use their driver's license or if somebody is from out of town and they like to use the bus, they have a driver's license or some other photo, photo ID to get on board. Um, the third thing it does is the transit department, or the next item it does, the transit department asks that we um, include in the budget that as time goes on, they will um, go ahead and take all of the various exemptions, not the exemptions, but the various photo IDs that are used and develop a system to rapidly be able to get those people once they need it um, into their own pass card. Um, and again, I think this is primarily as a marker for the budgeting process, just it's something they'll have to work towards. So they need to know that they need to budget in to get this technology and process going in the years forward. Uh, the next thing is, is that it goes ahead and the um, uh, Mr. Ramirez had asked that we go ahead and put in a, for the security, um, the, the redoing for the part that revamps the, um, gathering of security statistics from for the from the transit system that we go in there and that we look at a, we do a best practices search basically get another security plan in place for gathering statistics do a best practice search and that we use the Albuquerque Community Safety Department's a demographic profile method as a way of collecting data um, and I believe and then the final point is is this was developed by council staff to uh, try to just look at some methods by which they can kind of make bus stops, particularly bus shelters more likely and particularly bus uh, transit stations a little bit more active for positive uh, uh, events that might kind of make people feel a bit more comfortable and maybe help reduce crime, such as maybe having some you know, entertainment there or crime prevention through environmental design techniques, uh, just kind of something to make it a little bit more active like that. So those are primarily, that is uh, the, a, a summary of what the items are. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minacucci. So Mr. President, so, uh, we'll, 
We'll move uh, uh, the floor sub. So I'm going to, I need to officially move the floor sub to 047. All right. There's a motion for the floor substitute. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Councillor Pena, thank you. And any discussion on the substitute? Uh, I, I have to say, you know, I, wasn't a fan early on on, the, on this legislation, but uh, and I may still not be, but I, I, I appreciate the, the efforts of improvement. Mr. President, I, I mean, this is um, and the reason for the you know deferrals and and uh, and the uh, the floor subs is um, we really want to you know we've been working together with the with the department and you know really taking into account. Um, uh, the concern to the public and a lot of a lot of support for this too. By the way, um, uh, not form letters, but a lot of people who've written uh, personally and and contacted us and and uh, certainly seen a need for this. And you know, people that uh, uh, ride the ride the buses daily. And so, um, you know, appreciate the support on that. And then uh, again, the the uh, the desire here is to uh, ultimately have a bill um, with these substitutes that we've, we've you know uh, here tonight, as well as given the department time to complete the, you know, required studies that, you know, we have a bill that uh, will be good. And, I, and that's part of what we do is we, we, we suggest things and, and put things forward, put ideas forward and, you know, put them out there and try to try to make them the best possible, you know, policies that they can be. And so, you know, I believe this reflects that. Thank you. So uh, Councillor Sanchez has his hand up. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd just like to thank the uh, sponsors for um, working this whole bill and you can tell they put a lot of work into it based on the size the actual size of this of this bill um including the floor subs it looks like they've gone to no end to actually reach out to all entities and um and get the best the best bill possible and, and i can tell just by the deferral that they're still not done so i think it's really really a, a, a a good thing that that um, that people are coming together and finding solutions to uh, to to make it a good bill. Um, you know, my go I go back uh, riding buses my whole life. My dad was a city bus driver, and I have a lot of friends who are city bus drivers. And um, you know, I know there's some protections in there for for our bus drivers. And um, you know, seeing what they go through each and every day because I was with my dad as we rode buses for years, all the way up to my 18th birthday or when I bought my first car. And I was on the bus constantly because I had a free bus pass. And I, I, I remember what the bus drivers used to go through and, and it's a very, very demanding job and their pay is, is not where it should be. And hopefully this will help to actually retain those bus drivers. And so um, thank you to the sponsors for, for putting this together. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Pena. I just wanted to say before we vote on the floor sub or anything, I think we have several people signed up to speak, but I want a clarifying question. Somebody brought it to my attention, and this might be for, for <clears throat> Ms. Melendez. We actually have in, in the bill, throughout the bill, where it says uh, free fare, and what we call um, it currently is zero fare. So should we make those um, kind of technical changes now or... I just don't know what to do about that. That's the staff about that, Councillor. Because it is in the title, and then that would be changing the title again. Yeah, if there's another change to the title, we we uh, might want to just do it now. Mr. President, I would ask Mr. Minicucci for his assessment of whether or not that verbiage change has a technical distinction relative to what the bill is doing. Um, Mr. The, the verb, uh, Mr. President, I guess I'm just going to get the bill right away to get a hold of it. Um, Councilor, if you could clarify that there's, you're saying we have both free fare and zero fare. I probably, you cut out and I apologize. No, I was saying that currently we have zero fares and that's what we're trying to maintain as a zero fare um, as part of um, all the work that's being put into this bill. And throughout the new current legislation, we have free fare. Free fare, yeah. So, Madam Chair, I think that is uh, best I can put it is that's a discretion of the sponsors. Um, we had originally, and I've also when we authored the, when we uh, scribed the bill. Let me have put it that way for you. Um, we had used free fare because at the time we felt uh, 
trying that zero fare was kind of we were trying i was looking at it as what was the concept the concept was you just walk on and off the bus without any any um pass required or anything um so i think but the question is that's not like copyrighted or nor is there any formal definition so again if the sponsors would like to use zero fare there's nothing i think stopping them we were uh, at that and so that was just kind of a decision we made scribing which i think probably we can we can change if it's the council counselor to that yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Minicucci. I think that just to be consistent, I think we should maintain um, the word zero fares. Mm -hmm. yes, so if we can um, add, uh, I would make an motion to make an amendment to the floor sub, but I don't think we voted. You know, we have to... um, that... um, I think, Ms. Uh, Councilor Penny, I think you're preparing to make a motion to change all of the references uh, to zero fare to free fare, and that'd be amendment one to the floor sub. Is that what you're proposing? Opposite of what you said, but yes. Okay. From free fare, free fare to zero fare. Mr. President, uh, once the uh, the floor sub has been voted up upon, uh, Ms. Uh, Councilor Pena would be able to make that motion. All right. So we need to vote on the floor sub as it stands. Oh, Mr. Then, President, I, I'm, can... I'm sorry. I, I mixed myself up there. Uh, and the floor sub may be amended. It's been moved and seconded. The floor sub may at this time be amended um, as proposed by Councilor Pena. So if, Councilor Pena, if you'd like to restate that motion, um, that now would be the appropriate time. So I'd like to make a motion to amend um, all the references in O2247 from um, free fair to zero fair. And there's a second from Councilor Bassan. And Mr. President, I also have a question. Oh, Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, uh, just for clarification, it's 047, but the floor substitute. And then also, I just want to make sure, because what Councilor brings up, uh, Councilor Pena is saying, I, I just want to make sure that go on the record that I was under the impression that free fares and zero fares is quite different. And that was why we really made a big deal out of passing a zero fares program. So, Councillor Pena, I'm really happy that you're doing this change because I, you know, should this pass and then somewhere down the line, somebody say, well, that's great, it passed, but we don't have a free fare program. Um, I think that it is very important to keep the consistency there because due to the federal programming, I, it's my understanding that it is very significant and different at the same time. So this will this will be good and gain my support as well. All right, there's a motion and a second for the motion uh, uh, to amend the uh, floor sub as stated by Councilor Pena. Any other discussion? Before we go too far, has anyone signed up to speak on this? Mr. President, yes, we have uh, 23 signups to speak. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and dispense with this, this, uh, this amendment. And, uh, and get back to the floor sub and then we'll hear from the public. So uh, there's a motion uh, to amend the floor sub. Everyone understand that change? We'll go to a vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Thibelkorn. No. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. That passes on an eight to one vote. All right, we're back on the floor sub as amended. And if it's all right with everyone, we will. Do I, do I see a hand up? Councilor Pena, yeah. will you like to speak before we go to public comment? I don't know whether to interject because you can't see hands, but I just wanted to, to clarify that that was an amendment, an amendment to the floor subs, floor subs. Is that correct? Amendment to, I think, the second floor sub because there was already a previous one. Yeah, because you had said, yeah. Correct. There you go. Just for clarification, is there anything that we need to do with that, Mr. Melendez? 
Mr. President, Council Pendant, you, you'll still need to vote on the floor sub. It's been moved yeah. and amended. Now you need to finally vote on the second floor sub. Uh, and then at that point, after you've heard from comment, you'd be able to defer. If you'd like to hear comment before you vote on the floor sub, you may do that as well. Yes. It's what, whatever the pleasure of the count of the sponsors. I was just, thank you, Mr. President. Um, yes, Mr. Valenza, it was just that Councilor Benton had said that this was an amendment to the floor sub. So I was just clarifying that we didn't need to do anything to say this is the amendment the floor subs floor sub <laughs> mr president uh, the motion was for floor sub number two and so the amendment would rel would be relevant and attached to that floor sub number two um the vote that you take uh next will be on that floor sub number two as amended do, you want, do we need to take that vote now we can mr. proceed president. with that if you like if you, uh, I'd for the sponsors to decide on that all we all would move that I mean, it's moved, but I'd, I'd like to request that we vote on it. Okay, and I, I do see a kind of sense of his hand up before we vote. Thank you, Mr. President. I was just wanted some clarification because it says on number four of the floor sub, clarifies that Sun Van is free services for all person who are qualified to use the system. I just want to make sure that uh, our disabled veterans are, uh, are one of the individuals who actually qualify um, and anybody that's you know dis disabled in our community. <laughs> Um, because now it shows that the free service for all persons who are qualified. And I just wanted um, someone to be able to give me some information on that um, to see if the disabled, the disabled qualify. Anybody have an answer to that, Mr. Manacucci? I would assume that, um, that uh, disabled veterans or otherwise would qualify for use of Sunday. Um, uh, Mr. President, Ms. Councilor Sanchez, uh, hopefully trans will be there to answer a little bit more in depth. But first of all, um, people who I guess would have to meet the ADA standards qualify for Sunban and they're going to raise their hand to explain. Also under the bill, anybody with a veteran's identification or a current military identification uh, is, is allowed. It's, it, it acts as a pass. But uh, the, the mayor's office uh, has raised their hand. Okay, they'll hear from the mayor's conference room. Uh, yes, thank you, Councillor Benton, Councillor Sanchez, um, Leslie Keener, Director of Transit. Just to answer that, the qualification process for Sunban would remain the same. Um, we did have in the first floor substitute for which there was a, um, I believe, the um, $2 fare for the Sunban at that time. Um, but essentially, when you come in to apply, you have to give all the information that would qualify you for a free pass anyways. So that's why we changed that verbiage. But you still do have to qualify for Sunban services through our current application process to be able to use Sunban. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Pena. Yes, um, Mr. Manicucci, I thought we had said that we weren't going to do that. Um. Excuse, Madam, Madam Chair, I, I apologize, Mr. President, uh, Council Penny. I don't. I might understand. Yeah, I don't understand the question. I apologize. So, when we went over and we met with Transit, Transit had requested that we remove the paratransit um, from the bill so that they can maintain the same requirements. And I had said that I didn't. And I apologize if I'm not mm -hmm. looking at. So, Madam Chair, yes, the or go ahead if you all let you. Um, the bill, it's still at this point in time. Yeah, because I had said that I wanted paratransit to be zero fares because transit had stated that they would like us to take the paratransit out because they get a dollar, two dollars for every dollar. And I said, no, when we're talking zero fares, we're talking zero fares. So, this would be, I would, I wanted that to include Sunban as well. Yes, Councilor Pena, it still would include Sunban. It would be zero fare, but we are just saying that they still have to go through the Sunban application process. But once they do that and are qualified to ride Sunban per ADA requirements, at that point, it would be a zero fare for them. So this change, um, Mr. President, so this change actually occurred. I know we had discussed at our meeting for you to come up with a, a, a means on how to do this. And I think I didn't, I hadn't, that had been passed by me. So, so Madam, uh, Mr. President, uh, Councilor Pena, so at this point in time, the floor substitute 
if you qualify for Sunban, um, which are disabled to qualify for Sunban, you ride free. If, right. um, if you are, do not qualify for Sunban, um, then we don't quite know how to determine how you would be disabled. So what it is, is that you would then qualify for the regular pass. In other words, you would apply for a pass and you would just submit your name, um, your, your age and your, and your uh, contact. Okay, uh, just uh, just kind of a bummer because myself and I think Council Lewis had said it would be great if um, you can come up with something before it gets submitted into the bill that we could pass it by us because we wanted to maintain uh, zero fares because when people are talking about barriers for people who have disabilities and their ability to be able to get on the bus, I mean, when you have people who are in the using paratransit, those are the same challenges. So, um, you know, and they're, they're the most vulnerable. So I, that didn't get past me. I actually had a copy of the bill that we had agreed upon that day with a notation that you were gonna come back with a means, well, not you, Transit was gonna come back with the means on how to get that accomplished. So Ma Madam Chair, yes, what we have, we have a meeting with Transit um, the meeting with transit was is that they're trying to figure out a way to address linked trips with Sunban. Um, right now, they're trying to how to best manage that because as it stands now, zero fares. Sometimes they'll get people requesting three or four trips a day when they don't have the capacity to deliver that. So they're trying to figure out something on that. But what we can do is when we meet with them, we can look at trying to figure out some method. And I, I'll meet with you before that, that we can address your concerns then. Yeah, uh, I had that we had worked on. So I apologize and I apologize to the other sponsor. But, you know, I mean, when we're talking zero fares and we're here in the community that we want to remove all the barriers, especially for the most vulnerable, the most vulnerable to me would be people who are mostly who are using the paratransit. And I, I don't want you know, they have, and I think we had discussed that they have Medicaid cards and they have, so they wouldn't have to go to prove that they're disabled. They could just um, use their Medicaid card or the like, or their disability card or something like that. So yes. this is kind of contrary to everything if we're talking about our most vulnerable populations. So, Madam Chair, or Mr. President, Madam Chair, what we do have on there right now is they are able to use their Medicaid card. Um, we can go ahead, if there's another type of disabled card, we can go ahead and add that in. So I just heard from Transit, though, that they said that we'd have to fill out the application process. Um, I think, Madam Chairman, that's to use uh, the Sun Van. Um, I think you have to get qualified. So in other words, we would look at talking about, or Madam Chair, or Madam Chair, the sponsor, um, Councilor Scapena, we would have to go ahead and for Albuquerque ride, it would be for Albuquerque ride that you would be able to board. Um, we would try to look at seeing what type of disability cards identification are for them to be able to board Albuquerque ride. Councilor Pena, in order to use the um, the Sunban services, it, it's paratransit and it's an FTA requirement that they have to fill out an application um, to be considered um, within the disabilities and um, the parameters for that uh, use of the paratransit. So we don't have any way of getting around. Anyone who wants to use Sunban is gonna have to fill out an application. That's part of our FTA requirements. But once they fill out the application, it is free for them. So this kind of goes into the whole argument about zero fares and not um, having to do a pass or having to fill out an application to get a pass. I mean, this is really, you know, they currently do that, though. They currently do that with the uh, with the zero fare program. So what? I'm sorry. So we have to go through the application process currently with the zero fare pilot program. So that's going to remain in place. Well, but what's what's remaining in place too, though, is that with the paratransit, they're saying that people now, which I think is, I think it's awesome, is they're saying that people are using the paratransit now are making multiple rides a day, so it's costing more. So 
I had said that, well, we can figure out what that's the whole thing is removing barriers to access, right? So anyway, I, I guess I should have not had my copy. I should have gotten the, the formal copy that was that was um, introduced. So I guess we could just move forward, but um, yeah, we're gonna have to figure out a, something for that because if we we're, we're have issues with having zero fares and people having to fill out a pass in order to be able to get the get on the bus because that's a barrier to access, but yet we're saying the most vulnerable have to fill out an application to be able to get on, on the bus with zero fares, I just have kind of an <clears throat> issue with that. And I understand the federal requirements. I think we need to talk about that and what that looks like um, moving forward. So uh, with that, Mr. President, um, um, we can move forward to the public comment. I think I think the, the, what I heard from at least one of the sponsors was to go ahead and vote on the four sub and then hear public comment. Yes, sir. Is that all right with the sp other sponsors? Let's uh, yeah. let's go ahead and, and move to the vote on the floor sub, and then we'll hear the, the public commenters will be more clear on what they're commenting on. So uh, go ahead and with the vote, Ms. Inoha. Councilor Bassam. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Fiebelkorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. The floor sub number two as amended passes unanimously. All right, we're back on the bill as substituted. And um, we'll now go to public comment. Mr. Cornhead, yes. Thank you, Mr. President. Our first speaker is Karen Navarro, followed by Cynthia Rodriguez. Um, good evening, counselors. There are so many reasons to vote against this substitute. And I thought the vote on this was being deferred to January 4th, but now I'm very confused about that. First, Zero Fares is working and should continue. Obviously, it's too early to conclude evaluation of a pilot program that has six more months to go. Where in your bill do you restore the two day, $2 one day pass if you do end Zero Fares for the general public? I don't see it. If this is passed, someone could need to take two buses to get to their destination and two buses to get back home, which would be $4 for the one trip. In a couple, that would be $8. Uh, that's just one trip during the day. So without systematic data collection already gathered, which it hasn't been, and with six months to go in this pilot program, it's way too soon to roll out a whole new transit system. I don't understand this being considered tonight. I thought it was being deferred to January 4th. Thank you. Cynthia Rodriguez, followed by Ben Imbus. Ms. Pre Ms. President, Ms. Briefly. Yes, Councilor. All right, we'll uh, yeah, we just to clarify, we just we we didn't vote on this bill tonight. We just voted for a substitute and made some amendments. That's what we did, um, and so we're going to defer the the bill. And then, uh, Tom, didn't we just we just substituted? Uh, part of that was we did do the two dollar all day pass, correct? Or two dollars. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. President, uh, Councillor Lewis, yes, it is. I, when I did the uh, summary, that was one I, I did omit. I apologize. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah, we, we did do that in this. What we just passed in this uh, amendment substitute uh, did do exactly what uh, uh, what the speaker just said a moment ago as far as uh, a $2 um, all day pass. If, if you don't have a, a free pass. All right, let's continue with the public comment. Cynthia Rodriguez, followed by Ben Imbus. 
Hi, my name is Cynthia. I'm an organizer with the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Uh, I'm speaking today uh, for zero fares to stay how it is. Fares should be, it should be zero fares. It should be free for everybody. There shouldn't be obstacles in people's way to get on the bus. Asking people to get these passes, I mean, they could lose them. And then how do they get transportation to get a new one? You want them to have identification. I mean, the steps to go through getting an ID are, are insane. You, I mean, the things that you have to have available to you. And then you take away people's transportation to even get to these sites where these services are provided. It's ridiculous. Fares should be free for all. It's a public good. Um, and it should be offered to everybody without any kind of restrictions, without any kind of barriers to it. Um, it should just be a public good and a public right uh, for everybody to have the availability to ride the bus for free and the sun van too. Ben Inlis, followed by Jose Enriquez. Um, hello, hello everyone. Um, again, my name is Ben Imbus. Um, I'm a school teacher and I wanna speak in favor of the zero. One example of how this benefits people in our city is field trips, uh, school field trips. We often don't have money for buses. And so the school field trips rely on the city buses to get to the zoo or to wherever the field trip is going. And uh, so we rely on the zero fare as well. And uh, another thing I want to point out is, never mind. Uh, we need zero fare. Thank you. Should expand. Okay. Jose Enriquez, followed by Jason Santos. Uh, good evening. My name is Jose Enriquez. I'm an organizer with the Party for Social and Liberation and a union carpenter. I'm speaking for the in favor of the free bus fare program. I have benefited a lot from using the bus system in Albuquerque when I was younger. Growing up in a multilingual household, I had issues with speech. My mom, who escaped the violent dictatorship in Guatemala, didn't have a job and didn't know how to drive. My dad, who immigrated from Juarez, Mexico, worked nights at first supermarket. He couldn't take me because he was asleep in the day, and so my mom and I would go to my therapy sessions and take the bus. My mom and I have fond memories about those times on the bus and attending these speech therapy sessions have benefited, benefited me tremendously. At the moment, times are tough for financially for many people than they were back then, especially those who recently immigrated. These people shouldn't be punished for trying to make important health care or employment obligations or obligations that make it so they can stay in this country. We shouldn't make more barriers to use the bus like having to apply for a pass or have an ID to get a free bus there are barriers that will affect many people. If requiring an ID for free bus access was an ordinance during the time I was a kid, my mom wouldn't be able to get a pass because she didn't have a state ID or a driver's license. Just Thank, a you. Good job. Thank you, sir. Jason Santos, followed by Janice Herrera. Good evening, city councilors. Uh, here speaking in favor of the Zero Fare program. I think that adding more obstacles to people riding the bus is just going to be detrimental to our community. Uh, the people who are mm -hmm. facing these barriers are the ones who most need the bus. And so it doesn't make sense to keep kicking them out. Um, some of the reasons last time that you guys spoke about was like the increase in crime when we know that's not true. Uh, people using the bus as a getaway, also not true. Um, there is no reason why the program we have right now is not sufficient. Um, adding more obstacles is really uh, good for, for no one. Um, I hope that you guys, you know, reconsider. Uh, Mr. Santos, do you have uh, any other members that may be signed up uh, in the room with you? Yes. What names do we have, please, sir? Angelina Crowley. Just Angelina. Okay. Thank you very much. Up next yeah. is, go ahead, Angelina, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've heard the argument that this, uh, an ID would help it keep it safe and establish a system of respect. Um, we do need a system of respect on the bus. Uh, we need to pay the bus workers a lot more. We need the buses clean. Uh, we do need a dignified bus for the people of Albuquerque and we need it to be safe and accessible. People just need to be able to hop on the bus, 
have a bus that shows up on time, on schedule, and is not just running on central so people can get to their jobs. Uh, maybe put another person on the bus, pay another person to be there if there is a security issue or if there's issues keeping it clean um, because transportation is a right. And um, especially for homeless people and homeless women, um, if they were to get an ID and acquire that, which is already a huge obstacle and a huge feat for these people who don't have access to these things, how easy would that be for them to get it stolen if they're living on the streets or if they're in a vulnerable situation? And then what would they do? Because that's what happens. Um, so yeah, please don't do the ID thing. Janice Herrera, followed by Bex Hampton. Good evening, council president, city councilors. My name is Janice Herrera. I'm here tonight representing the Health Equity Council as a health promotion specialist. And so I'm looking at uh, Ordinance 2247 through the lens of health equity. Um, having a zero fares program has been tremendously helpful for the population we serve. I often deal with individuals who have lost their identification cards, um, who have lost their mail and other forms of verification as to who they are. And so um, we're really in support of having a hop on and go bus system that does not require cumbersome passes, um, identification cards or other barriers to access and the, that allows people to truly access the Zero First program um, that was initiated with this pilot, which we hope to see continue on beyond the length of the pilot term. I thank you for your time. Bex Hampton, followed by Althea May Atherton. Althea May Atherton, followed by Austin Wiecki. President Benson and members of the City Council, I find it extremely misleading to call this zero fare. Um, I think it will be damaging to our tourism industry to um, tell people, oh, we have zero fare and then have it work completely differently than it does in every other city in the country. Um, I'm just really kind of surprised and shocked that you all just did that substitution. Um, zero fare has actually been in national headlines uh, this week because the DC City Council is expected to pass a permanent zero fare program on their bus system tomorrow. Um, we are on the cutting edge of transportation in Albuquerque and O2247 would dismantle so many of the benefits of zero fare. The idea of zero fare is you get on the bus, you go, right? It's uh, no, no chances for discrimination, no friction, right? No barriers. Um, and we'd be placing those extra responsibilities on the bus drivers themselves. And in a city where we have terrible pedestrian fatality rates, horrible DWI rates, and so many other safety concerns, um, the bus is the safest place for us. And I, I really wanna make sure we're not introducing more risk into bus settings by adding all these fare conflicts and adding all these um, barriers. Thank you very much for your time. Austin Wiaki, followed by Rosemary Blanchard. Rosemary Blanchard, followed by, actually that would be back to Austin Wiaki if he's available. Thank you, uh, President uh, Benton, uh, members of the council. I had thought from what you said earlier that this was being deferred and so comments would be too. So I was cleaning my kitchen when I realized people were speaking. So I'm asking you to please not create a pass system for free public transportation on city buses. With the sweeps that are taking place, those bus passes will get swept with the other identity papers that are taken from unhoused people all the time when the police come and do their sweeps or when, uh, waste management makes does their sweeps. They'll also require interactions in locations and through procedures which will stymie both unhoused persons and others who have trouble dealing with bureaucratic requirements or getting into locations where passes can be obtained. This is not gonna solve the problem of security on public transportation. Indeed, it's often fair paying actors who cause the safety issues on buses. Uh, there's no good reason to make the situation of homeless people, disadvantaged people, those with developmental disabilities, others with special needs, any more difficult than they are already. 
This is to me just the city flexing. Thank you, Ms. Blanchard. Pat Davis has his hand up. Let's see what he has to say. Right. Thank I you. can wait till after the speakers, Mr. President. Pardon me. I can wait till after the speakers, Mr. President. Okay. All right. Thank you. That does conclude our public comment on this item. Well, in that case, David. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. I'll make it quick. No, I, I appreciate it. We heard a couple of speakers tonight, our PSL friends. Uh, Ms. Atherton is a wonderful advocate for transit. Um, and I just want to make it clear. I think, um, you know, they're absolutely right. This, as proposed today, um, this is not a zero fare program in the common parlance um, in, in public transit. Um, but as we've seen, this bill's evolving, you know, even from the dais, and I think it's become a vehicle, uh, no pun intended, a vehicle for learning about transit and the myriad of different options and the complications that go with it. So uh, I think the sponsors deserve to have the bill there that they would like. I, I'm like the president. I'm not ready to support it yet. I think there um, are some barriers that are still inherent in it, but I think it's getting better. And I want to give the sponsors the opportunity to do that. And so I want to make that clear to our friends that are out there supporting zero fare um, in the, the fullest sense of the word that um, that there are a number of other bills out there on this as well. And I think they're all going to come to a head for us uh, here in the next few meetings, whether that's in uh, January or then to December. Um, and so I encourage everybody to stay with us on this one. Uh, but I do think it's important to support the sponsors, let them have the bill they want. Uh, they're make, trying to make it better and make it work. And, uh, and we've seen some progress there. And so I encourage us all to participate in that process. And just to be clear, when we substitute a bill, uh, it, it's, it's uh, according to our rules, it is mandatory that it be deferred. So that's what's going on here. All right. Uh, any further discussion, counselors? Uh, we do uh, we do have a bill substituted, and then the next motion would be for the deferral, I believe. So um, yeah, I guess we'll we'll move a deferral here. But um, just to clarify, somebody mentioned about um, you know school kids going on school trips, um, and then you know the, the school would have to pay for it. I mean that's that's just not true. They could use their their they'd use their school IDs. And there's just a number of, uh, and that's why I really encourage people to read, really read the bill. And because I think that we've, um, uh, we've included just about everything that has come up, you know, that, uh, that you can imagine the way. So I think this truly is, you know, a, uh, if you want to call it zero fare, it really, it really truly is. It just adds a path system. And by, by deferring this, by taking the time on this, it does give other counselors a chance also not only to you know, for us to hear hear the bill out, but also for you guys to put together another bill, you know, a competing bill. And that's, uh, you know, that's that's because of how we've gone through this process and we didn't want to ram something through and get it all done, certainly provides uh, for that kind of a scenario as well. So, um, uh, so certainly want to encourage people to, you know, read it all, uh, read the uh, amendments that we made, a lot of discussion on it. Yeah, I think a lot of good things in here. So I'll, I'll move deferral. Not sure how far, how long. Uh, Tommy, what do you what do we recommend on the deferral? Um, um, Mr. President, uh, Councillor Lewis, one month to January fourth. So, Mr. President, I move a deferral to January fourth. There's a motion and a second from Councillor Sanchez, I believe. Any further discussion, uh, we'll move to a vote on the deferral. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Fubelcorn. Yes. Councilor Grant. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Councilor Pena? Yes. Councilor Sanchez? Yes. Councilor Benton? Yes. That passes unanimously. It is postponed as set twice and amended to January 4th. Thank you. We'll now move to item H, Councilor Grout, myself, 048. Councilor Grout? Thank you, Mr. President. 
048 is amending chapter five, article five of the revised ordinances of Albuquerque, the public purchases ordinance relating to exemptions from the competitive requirements of the code. I move it a due pass. Thank you. And there's a second from Councillor Feebleporn. Thank you. And uh, yeah, this is exempting uh, destination management organizations or DMOs, uh, which is a, a Visit Albuquerque uh, um, primary one, uh, do have to plan years out uh, for conventions and, and events here in Albuquerque for what they do. And so uh, the exercise of going through this, uh, these uh, supposedly competitive, but, but rarely has there been any competition. It's just a, an exercise that they've had to go through every year. And same as our meant this year. So uh, I'll turn it over to her to just explain that briefly, but that's what this is about. And uh, it, it's good for our industry to, uh, to have a longer window. Ms. Armenta. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. President, members of the council. And I appreciate um, the opportunity to be here this evening to answer any questions. We do, I think, have a couple of our uh, stakeholders, industry stakeholders um, signed up to speak, um, but very appreciative of the administration and the council sponsors for the opportunity to put this adjustment, um, this legislation forward. Really what it does is it gets our destination back to the industry standard and the best practice. Um, I can tell you, you can name for me any city that you believe is a competitor for us in tourism. And what I can assure you is that they do not bid for their services. Um, organizations like ours were built to do, provide this, to do this work. Um, we are a, an accredited organization. And um, that is what you want us, you want to keep us focused on bringing additional economic stimulation to the city and doing uh, as much as we can to improve the economy. So appreciate this opportunity. And I'll just, uh, I'll stay put after those speakers to see if there's any questions. And I have Thank one speaker, that a meeting planner, our meeting planner from our board, Christine Pauly from the American Society of Radiologic Technologists. She was on earlier, but she um, had to uh, had to depart for a conflicting meeting. I can read her statement if you'd like at, 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 uh, in just a moment. Let's hear from the uh, other speaker. Thank you. Our first speaker is Hilea Todd. Good evening. My name is Halia Todd and I am the Director of Operations for Sun Capital Hotels. We operate nine hotels in New Mexico. We have over 250 hardworking team members delivering exceptional service to every guest that visits this great land of enchantment. I am here to deliver a message from Deepesh Kolwadwala, our CEO, who couldn't attend this meeting tonight. Thank you for allowing me the time to make these remarks on his behalf. Honorable counselors, I am sorry that I couldn't attend. Allowing the city to contract directly with the DMO without issuing a request for proposal is, a, is of great importance to the business community that depends on Albuquerque tourism. Over the last 20 years, our company has been responsible for investing over 70 million in Albuquerque. We have another 45 million in the pipeline for construction over the next three years. The financial health of our hotels is extremely dependent on the continuous activities and actions of our DMO. But every three years, there is a disruption when the visit of Albuquerque must suspend unnecessary energy to compete for their contract with Albuquerque. I have more to go on, but I can stop. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Canfield. Uh, good evening, and I guess my, I'm off mute. Good evening, and thank you, Mr. President and Council, for allowing me to speak to this issue. Uh, my name is Mike Canfield. I'm the President and CEO of the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center, and I'm also the Chair-Elect to visit Albuquerque. Um, I think that the Chairman mentioned about D DMOs and their need for uh, working with clients for long-term, over long-term. Those sell selling cycles are very long, and they, have long, they need long-term relationships. So putting this contract out to bid can really be problematic in many ways. Um, organizations that make long-term decisions want to have continuity in who they deal with. Another challenge is uh, attracting talented employees in this industry. 
for some positions, we have the need to attract individuals with DMO experience. And these individuals want to know that their organizations will be around. So it's hard when the bid's coming up to attract talent. Um, so Visit Albuquerque continues to represent us very well. They know Albuquerque and New Mexico extremely well. And uh, they're excellent, have an excellent performance record. And so we hope that you support this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I have Tanya Armenta as our last speaker. Mr. President, would you like me to read the statement from Christine Pauley? Sure. Okay, I'll read it quickly. Uh, Christine Pauley, as I said, is a certified meeting professional and she's the director of meetings and conferences for the American Society of Radiologic Technologists, which is a national association based here in Albuquerque. She also serves on our board and she, uh, she stated, in my 20 years in the meetings industry, I have worked with destination marketing organizations all over the country. However, except for Albuquerque, because I live and work here, I've never worked with a DMO that had to participate in a competitive bid process with its city. And to be honest, I would not choose a city that has that model. Planner source and contract meetings several years in advance. In fact, we're now in the proposal phase for 2026. I can't imagine working closely with a DMO in the RFP proposal negotiation and planning phases only to find out in a couple of years that organization no longer represents the city. A DMO is an essential partner to meeting professionals. They know their city and what it has to offer better than anyone else. Um, and they get to know organizations such as mine. And she just says that she feels that they're um, that in her opinion, we have lost business and we will continue to lose business if we continue in the current model. Thank you. And, and yeah, having served on the executive committee for many years, so we, we've been round and round with this. And I think this is the right way to go and the right resolution. I appreciate co-sponsor Councillor Grout. And also, I know that Councillor Sanchez is, is a big supporter of, of what you're trying to do there. And, and this just makes common sense. That's sort of a close, but I'll let, <laughs> let Councillor Grout close also. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, this will help our economy um, in so many ways. Um, our tourism and marketing um, division, and um, we need a little, it'll bring a little stability. Um, they spend a lot of time with putting those RFPs together and lose and lose ground. And, and that's not what we want. Um, for this past year, I've had the opportunity to um, attend the board meetings and I can tell you that this is one top notch organization and I'm proud to have them represent us. And I urge your support. Thank you, Councillor. We'll move to a vote. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Fiebelkorn. Yes. Councillor Grout. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Lewis. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. And passes unanimously. Thank you. Move on to uh, item I, Councillors Jones, Fable Court, Grout, and Pena, 049. Councillor Pena. I would defer to Councillor Grout. I think she's the one that did most of the work on this. So perfect. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, let's see here. Own 49 uh, committee sub establishes the Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault Commission, establishing the responsibilities of the commission. I move a due pass. Second. Motion and a second from Councillor Fagelcorn. And uh, is there anyone signed up to speak? Yes, Mr. President, we have two speakers today. All right, let's hear from them. Our first speaker is Tiffany Hiron, followed by Yasmin Irizoki Ruiz.
Yasmin Irizoki Ruiz. Uh, good evening, Council President and City Council members. My name is Kasmini Dasoki Ruiz, and I'm a senior attorney at the New Mexico Immigrant Law Center. And we're a nonprofit legal organization who serves immigrant clients across the state free of charge. Uh, we serve the immigrant population that have been victims of domestic violence and sexual assault. And we strongly encourage you to approve O49 as many community members have been part of the recommendations, including creating this commission. And in doing so, the NMILC would greatly benefit from either participating or providing input. Again, we urge you to pass O49. Thank you. And we will go back to Tiffany Hiron. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Hiron Kimaremba. Um, my name is Tiffany Hiron. I am coming from the Coalition to Stop Violence Against Native Women. I am representing the Bernalillo County Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault Multidisciplinary Team. Um, we are a diverse group, of, diverse group of professionals working together with shared decision making in partnership with one another whose mission it is to address uh, the expansive needs of domestic violence and sexual assault victims in Bernalillo County. Uh, we also identified gaps in this um, in services and work to fill those gaps amongst both our team and other stakeholders. Um, some of the things that we would like to see from um, a part of our comments is um, paragraph A sub <laughs> to ensure that the five service provider voting members are legitimate service providers who represent the diverse communities affected by violence including but not limited to our Native communities and our LGBTQIA communities. Um, B, that concludes public comment on the item. Thank you. All right, we're back on the bill. And uh, sponsors, uh, Councilor Passan. Mr. President, I received some communications from people that wondered why I was not in support of this bill. I would like to clarify for everybody and anybody watching that I've always been in support of this bill. I have a feeling that probably as uh, we are only allowed up to a maximum of four sponsors on any bill, I was not one of them. I hope that my colleagues would have included me if we were allowed to do so. But I just want to make sure to clarify that because my name was not showing as the remaining female counselor on this bill as a sponsor, it did not mean that I, was, I wasn't in support of it. So I, I do support this bill and always have. Thank you, counselor. Uh, any other questions or comments? Appreciate the work of the sponsors on this. And and the support of Councilor Bassan. <laughs> Thank you. And with that, Mr. President, we would urge their support. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Sanchez, do you have your hands up? Sorry. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I think you missed it, but uh, I, I think this is a very, very important bill coming from a law enforcement background. It's something that is very, very, very much um, on the minds of numerous individuals and and I know this is something that needs to be uh, taken very, very seriously. You know, even as my business uh, operates, we sponsor a program called the Purple Purse um, through my Allstate Insurance Agent and it's all agency, and it's also dealing with victims of, of domestic violence. And, and everywhere I go, everywhere I turn, we need to make sure that this situation is addressed, domestic violence, is something that is very, very, very difficult to deal with. It's very difficult to, to come forward in certain cases. And, uh, and some of these folks feel that, that, they're, that they're trapped in these situations. And we need to reassure the victims that we are here to help and we need to give them every bit of support that we possibly can because um, some folks are treated in a way that, that is inhumane and uh, based on my experience, and we need to really, really protect the victims in these cases. So thank you so much. 
Thank you, Councillor. Sorry for missing them. I had that same problem at the top of my screen here. But uh, but I think it's been uh, moved, seconded, and closed. So we'll go to a vote. Yeah, Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Grout, Councilor Grout, did you want to make a comment before we take the vote? I did. I just wanted to say that domestic violence is real. It affects everyone. Um, and it's sad. Um, if there's anybody out there that is watching that is um, in need, um, please know that you're not alone. You can call the no National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233 to talk to anyone. And if it's an emergency, do call 911. But please know that we're here to support you and, and reach out to somebody. Thank you. Thank you, Counselor. Important information. We'll, we'll move to a vote unless there are any other comments. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Fablecorn. Enthusiastically, yes. Thank you. Councillor Grout. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Lewis. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. That passes unanimously. Thank you. Congratulations, Councillor. Good work. Um, I'll move uh, 050. This is approving a project involving Craftworks LLC pursuant to the LIDA Act and the city ordinance to support the acquisition, renovation, and improvement of a beverage manufacturing distribution facility in Albuquerque and repealing all actions and consistent with this ordinance, I move it to pass. There's a second from Councilor Feeblecorn, thank you. Uh, and we do have some folks here to speak from our Economic Will Development Department. Chris Chavez will have them MC the uh, comments from the proposers and the department. Um, thank you, Councilor, uh, Council President Benton and the entire city council for considering our project today. Uh, Craftworks LLC is seeking LIDA funding in the amount of $400,000. The state has agreed to pay, uh, provide $350,000, and the city proposes to provide $50,000. Uh, the city would serve as fiscal agent for the state's funds. This is an expansion project for a locally grown manufacturer. Uh, Craftworks was established in New Mexico in 2015 and is engaged in the business of manufacturing alcoholic beverages for consumption. Uh, the company, through its Sandia Hard Cider line, has uh, rapidly expanded its territory and customer base. Um, Craftworks products are currently sold within the state in major chains such as Albertsons, Walmart, Costco, Total Wine, and many others. Uh, the company is on tap and sold on premises in uh, over 200 local bars and restaurants, including national chains. Um, their expansion is catalyzed by significant distribution contracts in Texas. Um, over 80% of their new revenue will be coming from, uh, from Texas. And um, they're going to be relo ro relocating their beverage manufacturing facility in Albuquerque to a new facility located at 1501 12th Street. Um, this is a building that used to house uh, Sacred Power. Uh, the relocation would allow them to increase their production capabilities over the long term. Uh, the improvements to the building will include upgrading electrical service, uh, installing floor drains, uh, HVAC plumbing upgrades, and uh, additional build out of the facility. Manufacturing is an allowable use per the city's integrated development ordinance. Um, in support of the expansion, the company will need to hire uh, 20 additional employees, bringing their total to 27. The newly created positions will pay on average $40,000, and the company expects the majority of these jobs to be fulfilled uh, to be filled by Albuquerque residents. Uh, the new jobs will fill gaps in manufacturing, uh, including those for brewing, distilling, testing, warehouse, packaging, production. Uh, this is a high quality employer that will create new high quality, uh, high paying jobs for Albuquerque residents in a high growth, notable industry. Uh, the lead project includes a fiscal impact analysis provided by 
uh, the New Mexico Economic Development Department, Department. The analysis shows that the company will be making a substantive contribution to the community. Overall, the city will receive over 447,000 in net benefits over the 10 year period of the project. Um, and the project will generate 1.7 million in total for all local taxing districts. LIDA 22-8 is a qualified project as defined by the state's Local Economic Development Act and city enabling leg legislation. The project complies with the adopted city plans and policies and meets community economic development priorities and objectives. Based on the above findings, staff recommends the approval of 22-8 as proposed in the project plan application. Um, and we're thrilled that the company has made it uh, a continued commitment to the city and is investing all this uh, time and energy and uh, capital into our community. And uh, we want to thank them and the state and area for all their help with making this project uh, become a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chavez. Uh, we have some other guests. I see uh, our friend Max Gruner from Mexico Economic Development, sir. Mr. Council President, uh, members of the council, thank you very much. Um, I want to thank you for your service. It's a late night. Uh, once again, I uh, need to extend my thank you, my deep appreciation, and my respect to the Albuquerque Economic Development, without whom this would not be possible. Uh, the state is fully committed to this, to this project. We're excited to be able to contribute uh, leader funding, state leader funding, to the expansion and I, I um, respectfully urge uh, council to uh, pass this project. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Chris, do you have anyone else uh, that would like to speak with you? Yes, we have uh, Miguel Melendez with the company. Uh, yes, Mr. President, members of the council, I truly appreciate the consideration by the council in this matter. <coughs> I want to uh, thank the city's and state's economic development teams that have been working with me now for uh, close to a year. Uh, I'm a born new and raised New Mexican, and this is truly a New Mexico success story. Our growth and expansion would not have been possible without the support of our city and the many Burqueños who appreciate our products. My commitment has always been to hire and create careers for New Mexicans and to focus our products in New Mexico and recently beyond. Uh, we have survived COVID. We have persevered through ongoing supply chain issues. We have been battling inflation even as we speak. And despite all of the challenges we have faced since 2015, we have never been more optimistic about how this company will continue to succeed. I truly appreciate the council's consideration tonight and encourage your vote. Thank you so much. Thank you. We also have our uh, attorney, Chris Muirhead, if there are any technical questions on the leader, counselors. Seeing none, thanks for sticking with us, Chris. Absolutely, thank you, sir. Thanks for your help as usual. And we're back on the bill. Councilors, any further discussion? If not, we'll move to a vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Fiebelkorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. It passes unanimously. Thank you. Congratulations, gentlemen. Uh, Councilor Davis, 053. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll try to make this quick. 053 repeals the Albuquerque Tax Preparer Consumer Rights Ordinance in its entirety and creates the new Tax Preparer Ordinance. I move a due pass. And there's a second. Councilor Fievel Corn. Do you have anyone sign up to speak? Yes, Mr. President, we do. Our first speaker on the topic is Andrew Schultz, followed by Grace Allison. 
Good evening. My name is Andrew Schultz. I'm an attorney with the Rhodey Law Firm, and I represent ACTOR, which is the American Coalition for Taxpayer Rights. This is an organization that represents the leading tax preparers, uh, both of retail and of online services in the country. When the city council initially passed the taxpayer, tax preparer ordinance back in 2021, it did so without any input from the industry. We approached the city council, the city council understood the need to make revisions. And in the last year, we have worked diligently with the city attorney's office, with representatives of consumers, and particularly with Councilman Davis's offices to make sure that this new bill is fair and accurately reflects the taxpayer experience. We urge the council to <coughs> revision. Grace Allison, followed by Maria Griego. Mr. President, counselors, thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. Currently, Albuquerque consumers who want to purchase commercial income tax preparation services have less information about pricing and quality before making that purchase than they do before purchasing a pair of socks. The disclosures about pricing and preparer qualifications required by the ordinance will help Albuquerque families make better choices about services vital to their well being. Because of child-based tax credits, such as the earned income and child tax credits, income tax refunds comprise roughly 20% of a low-income family's annual cash flow nationwide. Informed choice about income tax preparation means more refund dollars will reach our citizens' pockets. Thank you. Maria Griego, followed by Aurora. Ariola. Thank you, Mr. President and members of the council. My name is Maria Grego and I'm the Director of Economic Equity with the New Mexico Center on Law and Poverty. In recent years, the center has worked to improve access to fair lending and to combat predatory lending practices. What we routinely see is that refund anticipation <laughs> loans, which are loans from tax preparers, given an anticipation of a tax refund are a major problem for low-income borrowers. Over half of all refund anticipation loan borrowers um, in 2020 qualified for the earned income tax credit according to the financial institution division data. These tax credits are incredibly important for low-income families as they are often used to cover basic needs and expenses. When consumers take out these loans, it is often difficult to understand the true cost after taking into account the laundry list of fees and charges that will ultimately be deducted from their refund. This bill will help low-income borrowers make informed decisions about any loans they may choose to take out by requiring upfront fee disclosures. For this reason, the center supports this bill. Aurora Ariola, followed by Yasmin Irizoki Ruiz. Good evening, Council President Benton and City Councilors. My name is Aurora Arriola. I'm a full-time volunteer for the New Mexico Immigrant Law Center. The New Mexico Immigrant Law Center is a nonprofit legal organization offering free legal services to New Mexican immigrants, and we urge the City Council to pass O53. Through my experience at NMILC, I have come to learn that the immigrant community is not only grateful for support, but they also <laughs> want to follow the rules and regulations required of them to conduct business in our city. However, Many are hesitant to ask questions or push back because they feel they should just really be grateful for getting help in their language. For that reason, it is imperative that this ordinance is passed so that tax preparers provide the right information to immigrant taxpayers and other vulnerable populations. Moreover, because falling victim to predatory practices is common in the immigrant community, many immigrants who are starting their business are hesitant to trust information provided to them. So it is important for individuals who are seeking tax services to have the opportunity to be properly informed, have tax prepared contact information, such as CIN. Thank you for considering the tax preparation ordinance and we urge you to pass 053. Yasmin Irizoki Ruiz. Good evening, Council President and City Councilors. As I mentioned earlier, my name is Yasmin and I'm a senior attorney at the New Mexico Immigrant Law Center. I'm commenting in favor of the Albuquerque Tax Preparer Ordinance and we urge City Council to pass O53. 
As the economic justice and policy attorney for NMILC, I participated in meetings to provide input and come to this version of the legislation because of the interest of immigrant taxpayers. It may come as a surprise to many, but it is imperative for immigrant clients to have access to competent tax preparation services, and this ordinance would aid in ensuring that. Taxes are often used to prove good moral character in immigration cases, and we have seen numerous instances in which our clients have found themselves in difficult situations because they have been victims of predatory tax preparation services. The version before you would be a positive step in protecting vulnerable taxpayers in our cities. Thank you for your consideration. Mr. President, that concludes public comment. All right, thank you. Any other comments or questions, counselors? Councilor Davis to close. Mr. President, this is one of those really rare places where uh, after a lot of cajoling and, and uh, meeting and back and forth arguing, uh, the advocates and the industry have come to an agreement on something. And as you all heard, none of our speakers opposed it. And so we encourage you all to support it as well. Thank you, Councillor. We'll move to a vote. Councillor Besson. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Fubicorn. Yes. Councillor Grout. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Lewis. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. And that passes unanimously. Thank you. They'll now I'll move to item M. Uh, Councillor Davis, R74. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, R-74 approves the University Metropolitan Redevelopment Area Plan. I need a second. Thank you. There's a second from Councilor Bassan. Thank you. Mr. President, I'll make this quick. I know we have friends in the administration who may want to weigh in, but this is a fairly straightforward. We've seen this before and through committees. This creates the new MR uh, designation for that stretch of central along and near the university. It sort of connects the, the downtown MR districts with those out further on East Central and starts to allow us to recreate and reconnect um, the community connection around the university uh, for those neighborhoods. And so we urge your support. Thank you. Uh, administration like to speak? Uh, Mr. President, Councilor Davis, um, this is Terry Bruner. I'm the director of the Metropolitan Redevelopment Agency. I um, want to thank Councillor Davis for all of his support throughout on this plan. We're really excited about this MRA plan. It does some different things than our prior plans. Um, for instance, having a stakeholders group um, to focus on implementation of the plan, that group's already starting to meet. So we're excited about that. It also recommends some good stuff on, uh, on pedestrian and bicycle areas, increasing housing options, and uh, we have good support from the university as well. So we're really optimistic that with this particular MRA plan, we'll get to team up with UNM and the commercial business interests in the area and, and housing interests and, and really have a joint effort to, to really rehab uh, in particular Central and Yale in that environment. So we're excited about this plan and excited to get going on it. So thank you. Thank you. New discussion, counselors. Councilor Davis to close. Uh, Mr. President, thank you very much. It's been a long effort and I'm uh, grateful to see Mr. Bruner here and, uh, and helping to bring this home, but it's been a multi-year effort and we appreciate everyone's support, urge your support. Thank you. We'll move to a vote. Councilor Busson. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Fiebelkorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Lewis. Yes. Councillor Pena. Councillor Pena. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. That passes unanimously. 
Okay, we'll now move to item N, R76, Councillor Bassan, myself, and Councillor Jones. Uh, I'll move it, do pass. And this second, okay. Councillor Bassan, thank you. Um, and this uh, Councillor is, uh, is uh, really a fairly simple bill. There's a lot of discussion about uh, aggressive vehicular noise in the city, but, um, but this specifically um, would uh, direct the administration to take a look at the current technology that's available to look at automated technology uh, to uh, detect illegal uh, vehicle noise. And um, we know there are, this is just one potential piece of the puzzle with regard to this aggressive behavior, but, um, and, and there are other things could be done as well, but we have looked into it uh, with the council staff and um, we know that these systems are available and, um, and can be checked out by a city on a trial basis at a fairly low cost. So um, that's kind of what it's about. Um, should not be a high cost uh, issue to, to try it out, but um, we'll, uh, we will uh, go ahead and, and uh, hear any, do we have public comments signed up on this one? Yes, Mr. President, we do. Why don't we hear from folks who are signed up? <laughs> Our first speaker is Nick Ferenczak, followed by Andrea Calderon. Good evening, and thank you, Mr. President and counselors for the opportunity to speak here. My name is Nick Ferenczak. I'm a professor in the civil engineering department up at UNM, um, and I'd like to commend the counselors for putting forth this uh, automated vehicle noise enforcement program. I think it's a very forward-thinking approach to an important public health issue. Uh, I just wanted to let you all know that we've actually been working on this technology right here in Albuquerque for a couple of years. Um, I've been talking to Nathan Molina on your staff as well, and I just hope that we can uh, continue to work together to solve this important uh, noise issue. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Andrea Calderon. Hi, apologies for the delay. I just uh, I just got access to uh, to speak. Um, I don't know if you want to start the timer. All right, it is like almost five hours after we started this meeting. Um, so this has been very exciting, very active meeting. And I, I know that this bill has already been discussed and it's on final action. Um, and Councillor Benton, I think um, I had commented last time on um, supporting sort of your interest in public health and um, and the need for a data evaluation for this pilot. Um, but, you know, I think I missed a pretty significant point last time. Um, I think there are a number of things that really could be coupled with this bill um, and suggested amendments that would actually um, sort of create a cluster of, um, a, you know, approaches to public health when it comes to noise. Um, and I just did not see them coupled in here. I used to live on Cole and Edith, right on the edge of Huning Highlands and South Broadway. And I got to tell you, my single pane windows on my historic, you know, apartment were conducive to keeping it quiet um, while I was in grad school and working full time from home. So, um, yeah, I just would I would just encourage for uh, additional amendments to the bill and to the pilot, um, and would be happy to provide any written suggestions. Um, thank you. Thank you. Mr. President, that concludes comments on this item. And just, just with regard to the, the uh, last comments from Andrea, I fully agree. And, and, and um, we know that there are other options as well that we need to be looking at. Uh, but, but this is a limited uh, first step. And uh, we've also discussed other links to environmental health and uh, possible emissions testing programs that already exist as how those could be linked in. But this is really just uh, 
to, to get our city started to just taking a look at the technology for starters. So um, that's kind of where we are with it. But uh, of course, I'll leave it up to my sponsors if they would like to, uh, to uh, re redirect it in some way. Any further discussion, counselors? Appreciate the, the co-sponsors interest in this. We, you know, this is a this is a plague that we have in the city, and, and uh, we appreciate APD. Uh, really, for the first time under this uh, APD leadership, has been taking this issue seriously and has issued uh, some tickets over the, over the last couple of years. And I think that it's helped. It's it's gotten a word out there that that it's not okay. Uh, to do this kind of behavior, but it's, uh, as we know, they're stretched thin. We've had a lot of discussion about that, and uh, this is a possible way to uh, to be a, uh, what do they call it, a force multiplier <laughs> for, for our police department to try to cut down aggressive driving behavior. But with that, I'll ask my sponsors if they like to close, and so we can get moving on this. Commissioner Bissonner Jones. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> Mr. President. I do. I urge your support as well, but I just I thank you for including us, especially going back to the mobile speed enforcement conversations when all of this began quite a while ago. Yeah, I think there's been good collaboration amongst counselors on on these issues of, of just aggressive behavior on the streets. <laughs> well, thanks for that. We'll move to a vote. Councilor Uh, uh Councilor Davis, sorry. Uh, just a quick comment, it, it won't take long. I, I just wanna say, as the only counselor who voted against the, the speed cameras, um, I think this is a good approach to uh, electronic enforcement. And I don't wanna make the distinction why <laughs> today one of our reporters did. Um, I think this matters because this is using the enforcement against the vehicle. It's identifying the vehicle. I realize the, the notice goes, I assume, to the, uh, to the registered owner. Um, but this is a good way to target vehicles that are improperly on our streets. I, I still am not yet persuaded that the speed cameras are, uh, are deterring people from, from speeding. Uh, but this is definitely helping us identify errant vehicles that are improperly on our streets and uh, giving notice to owners that they have to correct them. And so I do think this is a good one. Um, and I'm encouraged and excited to hear that local folks are working on it and that we might be able to, to help everybody else solve this problem. So I appreciate everyone working so hard on it, especially to the sponsors who uh, have really been trying to come up with this solution. So, and uh, thank you. And thank you, Mr. President, for continuing to push this. This has been a personal project of yours, I know for a couple of years now, so thank you. Thanks, Counselor. All right, sorry, I missed your hand. You're in the top row, so I think that's where the hands are supposed to appear. So of course it's not working on my computer, but all right, we'll go to a vote. Counselor Bassan. Yes. Counselor Davis. Yes. Counselor Peeblecorn. Yes. Counselor Grout. Yes. Mm. Counselor Jones. Yes. Counselor Lewis. Yes. Councillor Pena. No. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. That passes on an eight to one vote. Thank you. Next is R87. Uh, this is approving an award from U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development for Community Development Block Grant CARES Act funding and an award from the state of New Mexico beginning fiscal year 2023, I move a due pass. And a second from Councilor Passan, thank you. Anyone signed up to speak on this? No, Mr. President. All right. This is uh, as, as described in the title, I urge your support. M? Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Peeblecorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. 
Councillor Benton. Yes. Passes unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Hinojos. We're now on item Q, our Thanks. last item of the evening. And this is uh, Councilor Pena, Fable Corn, and Bassan. Ms. President, just right. say oh. item O. Oh. oh, did I miss one or more? Uh, sorry. Uh, beg your pardon. Uh, item O, Councilor Sanchez, Memorial 6. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Memorial 6 is asking a, the New Mexico legislature to reinstate qualified immunity. I move a due pass. Second. There's a motion and a second for a due pass on M6. Anyone signed up to speak on this item? Yes, Mr. President, we have several speakers. Why don't we hear from them? Uh, first speaker on my list is Cynthia Rodriguez, followed by Carl Perkins. Hi, my name is Cynthia Rodriguez, and I'm an organizer with the Party for Socialism and Liberation. And I'm here to uh, ask the City Council to vote no to M226 and to actually enforce uh, the consent decree and hold police accountable. Um, so Monday, November 7th, uh, Sanchez introduced this memorial uh, that asked the state to bring back qualified immunity. And uh, since that city council meeting, APD has killed like, or like shot at or, and killed at least three people in Albuquerque since then. It's been a month. It's been 30 days. Um, and they couldn't manage to not kill anybody. Um, so in this past year, there's been uh, 18 people shot at. Um, or shot by APD, which is actually an increase from last year, uh, showing that they haven't been reformed or anything like that. So the idea that we shouldn't hold them accountable for their actions is ridiculous. Uh, families of victims of police brutality should have all avenues to seek justice uh, killer cops. Carl Perkins, followed by Ben Imbus. Ben Imbus, followed by Jose Enriquez. I want to reiterate uh, that qualified immunity is not the solution to the many problems we're facing, um, especially it, the argument that it will attract police officers since we don't have enough police officers, supposedly, I, I think is the wrong solution. Um, again, first, if we're attracting officers by the promise of reduced accountability, then we are attracting the wrong people to, to work for Albuquerque. Uh, second, the cities with qualified immunity do not, the cities with qualified immunity do not, have not solved their shortage. So that's, it's clearly not going to solve our problem. Uh, three, not having enough police officers really speaks to the fact that we are asking police officers to do what is not a, a police issue. It makes no sense to ask police officers respond to drug addiction, homeless, youth petty crime, welfare checks. We need social services. We need after school programs. We need medical attention. We need accessibility. Thank you. Jose Enriquez followed by Jason Santos. Uh, hello again. Um, I also oppose City Council Memorial 226. I understand this year has been a violent year in Albuquerque and it's affected uh, me kind of personally. Earlier this year, there was a homicide that happened across my home at the intersection of Buena Vista, Buena Vista Drive and Bull Place Southeast on June 13th. Uh, with this type of violence taking place right across the street from where my partner and I live, I still don't think bringing back qualified immunity will lower homicide rates or any other type of crime. Uh, Luis's Chan Sanchez notion that getting rid of the qualified immunity will increase APD recruitment numbers is pure idealism. Uh, across the country, even police departments that do enjoy th the disgusting privilege, they're having a hard time recruiting new officers. Uh, Luis Sanchez also stated during the April 18th meeting of the city council that he's been in unions before and been in unions that have had slugs and that he had worked with them. Luis Sanchez has also made it clear that he was a cop with APD, which has a union, in the pre-lease meeting when Memorial 22 State was up for debate. Is it responsible to give qualified immunity to cops who commit crime and are allegedly lazy or slapping on the job? 
Jason Santos, followed by Roger Culp. Good evening, City Council. Uh, my name is Jason Santos. I'm speaking uh, against N22-6. Uh, the language of the memorial uh, itself and Sanchez's comments from the uh, previous council meeting uh, seems to imply that reinstating qualified immunity would help improve retention rates in our local police force. But as the chief of police came on last time and said, uh, we're seeing these police shortages and retention rate issues across the country, uh, in which case it makes no sense to try to argue that uh, reinstating qualified immunity will help us uh, build a stronger police force. Uh, it seems to me that uh, the issue with policing is uh, policing itself. It's not that we're not offering protection for cops to go out and you know murder people. Uh, instead, we should be looking at well, how can we improve policing by not sending them out uh, to you know things that, that social workers can be going to or other groups. Um, if we want to fix crime rates here in Albuquerque, we should be focusing on access to education, healthcare, uh, housing, uh, make sure people are treated well, and you know, um, taking care of citizens so they don't have to resort to crime. Thank you. Roger Culp, followed by Julian Morales. Julian Morales, followed by Dex Hampton. Hello, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, city councilors. I'd like to uh, just speak my uh, part in support of M226, uh, that uh, qualified immunity, I believe, is uh, needed for the police officers because um, these guys seem to think cops are just going out there and shooting people because they want to or because they uh, are not having a, a good day or whatever the case may be. But these these cops are out there defending or protecting us and our citizens, and, and they shouldn't have to worry about uh, uh, not coming home at night or their families or it, much less uh, worried about being sued or whatever personally because of a uh, maybe a, a position that they may be in to having to shoot somebody. So... I, I support it, so I think that it would be a good thing for uh, our uh, cops to have um, um, uh, just a positive attitude to go to work every day. Bex Hampton, followed by Angelina Crowley. Angelina Crowley, followed by Bob Martinez. Bob Martinez, followed by Andrea Calderon. Andrea Calderon, followed by Nick Rimmer. Hello, it's me again. Um, so as you know, I'm a big fan of accountability and fiscal responsibility. Um, there's accountability for servers and fractions for those that hold juris doctorates. Um, and there should also be repercussions, I believe, for public safety professionals. So definitely lots of accountability for folks that do data. If data is incorrect, you take the fall. Um, but there's no risk department or safety net available for other professionals, right? So the city allocates $12 million for that or has for FY 23, 2023. And I just... You know, I truly believe that if that kind of safety net um, occurs, that we will not be uh, encouraging folks to take best practice. Um, and we're actually going to be allowing an opportunity for misconduct to occur. I'm a big I'm a big supporter of everybody doing the best that they can at their job. Um, and if you know that you can do that and uh, the system's got your back, regardless, whatever position you're in, you're prevented from really reaching your full potential. So I implore you to reconsider supporting the memorial on the reinstatement of qualified immunity and divert any potential costs, whether they, they be to pay for administrative staff time or legal supports to support other departments whose capacity is strapped and could definitely use additional funding. Um, I definitely encourage you to, you know, I mean, I know that there are a lot of different opinions regarding public safety on the, on the council. Um, really appreciate all of the back and forth that goes on. Obviously, I'm a big fan, um, but um, you know, I just I just think that this is something that uh, 
it really encourages us to have the best practices possible when it comes to the conduct of our public safety officials. Thank you. Nick Rimmer. Nick Rimmer. Can you hear me? Let me uh, get started here. So my name's Nick. I'm an organizer with the Party for Socialism. And We can hear you, Mr. Rimmer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think they just skipped you. No, you're not. Sure. So All right, I'm going to start over here. So I'm an organizer with the Party for Socialism and Liberation. I'm asking you to vote no on M22-6. Uh, qualified immunity is an undemocratic invention of unelected federal judges from the 1980s. Uh, it was developed as a reaction to the expansion of democratic rights uh, seen in the 50s and 60s uh, by the U.S. Civil Rights uh, Movement, which relied heavily on Section 1983. Uh, to hold uh, police officers and other public officials accountable uh, under law. Uh, we have to abolish any obstacle that limits justice uh, for the families of Brett Rosanaw, Colin Nizozzi, Keyshawn Thomas, and the countless other victims of police terror. Qualified immunity has no place in a city with a long history uh, as probably the uh, highest, uh, you know, most per capita rate of police shootings and murder. As recently reported in 2022, our city will likely break the record for APD police shootings and murders. We demand an end to police terror, the prosecution of all killer cops, and vote no on M22-6. That concludes public comments. Thank you, Thank you. President. You're muted, Mr. President. Mr. Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to thank Mr. Rimmer for his nice um, um, F words as we were uh, approaching this. He was online and didn't know it. Um, but uh, basically, obviously nobody knows what officers do. Um, Officers do a job that has to deal with the bad guy. The guy, they go in towards trouble. They run towards the issues to take care of our families, our friends, the individuals that we cherish. Officers don't go into the job because they want to kill somebody or hurt someone. Officers go into the job because they want to help people and protect people and do the right things for the citizens of Albuquerque. We hear countless stories of how officers have saved lives, have helped a pregnant woman, have dealt with domestic violence situations, have done uh, protected um, the public from violent crime. Over and over and over, these things happen, these, these things occur. We see officers getting awards for, for delivering babies. Millions and millions of positive contacts are dealt with by officers. These officers are professionals. They don't come into the job just walking through the door and getting one interview. The process to become an officer is lengthy. It's very, very hard to get through. And if you don't have the right mindset and you're not understanding how it is to take care of people and work with people and make sure that you have a positive outcome, then you have a very, very small um, education when it comes to officers and what officers do for us, the public. We just passed a bill protecting victims of domestic violence. That bill was an important bill to pass. Officers need help. We need help as citizens, as society. We're getting violent, more violent as the day goes by. 
And a lot of this violence is due to because we have lack of officers. When officers are available and when officers are out and about and you drive around and you see police cars, you're less likely to commit the crime. It's, the, it's just being out there and letting, the, and letting the public see that you're out there. When I was a sergeant, that was, I mean, when I was an officer, that was the first thing my sergeant used to say is be visible. Make sure you're driving down the streets. Make sure that the citizens know that you're there. Make sure that the kids and the children know that you're there to help them in whatever, in whatever you need. We train our children right now to dial 911 when they're in an emergency situation. <laughs> It's very important that we support our police officers and build our police department. Like I said, millions and millions of positive contacts. And sure, we still, we still have our issues, but everybody does. But if you look at the amount of contacts that office, the positive contacts that officers have versus the negative ones, that's what we need to grow. And I believe that, that this is a very, very important thing to pass on to our legislature so that we can help with our with the growth of our departments, with the retention of our officers, to make sure that we back them up and support them. I have numerous police chiefs. The last police chief, Chief Polazar, Chief Baca, uh, Chief Geyer, um, all three of those police chiefs with 40 uh, years of experience each, which is over 120 years of experience. Have told, have told us and told me and sent letters to support this bill. That's 120 years of law enforcement experience to support the bill. Every officer that's listening to us right now is hoping that we support them with the passing of this memorial so that we can move that towards the legislature. It's very, very important. We have support from... from uh, the current president of the FOP, the immediate uh, Toby Gallegos, the immediate past president of the FOP, Bob Martinez, and the current state president, Rob Pada, all support any tool to support law enforcement and recruitment and retention efforts. And we need to give the officers the tools to do their job and to make sure that they keep all of us, our public safe. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fiva Corn, followed by Councillor Davis. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, George Floyd, Philando Castile, Freddie Gray, Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, Brianna Taylor, all names that we should know and we should look to for what happens when there is qualified immunity and people are above the law. You don't have to look to those names from across the nation. You can look here in Albuquerque, James Boyd, Mary Hawks, Brett Rosenau, and so many more that we don't have time for me to say them all. I am thankful that the New Mexico State Legislature has ended qualified immunity and has said that no one in our state is above the law. Everyone in our state has to follow the law. And I'm really glad that they will not be overturning that. Um, so for those reasons, and I will, I will be opposing this bill. Um, thank you. Elsa Davis. Thank you. I appreciate uh, where the sponsors have started with this. And, you know, I, I, we often hear in, I think Councilor Sanchez and I go back and forth uh, when he says, well, nobody knows what it's like to be a cop. And I remind them, I do. Um, I was in a shooting in Washington, D.C. I've worked in some of the biggest and hardest cities in the country. Um, and I've supervised a lot of officers who've been involved in some really critical incidents and had to make hard decisions as a supervisor about whether somebody made the right decision, even in that moment. But precisely for all the reasons that my good friend from the West Side, uh, my, my colleague uh, in blue, just mentioned that when you're in trouble and you need somebody, you want somebody who's coming to follow the rules to help. Um, and all of us got into that job because we wanted to help and we understood the value and the importance of following the law. And we, we upheld the law as something important and bigger than all of us. And it is possible to be a cop without violating someone's civil rights. And if you don't think that you can do that, 
this is not the department for you. And quite frankly, I think the legislature said this is not New Mexico for you. This is not the state for you to do that. Um, we've seen enough problems with a few bad apples who couldn't, who have tainted the entire profession um, and created friction in our community that's not necessary. I'm proud of APD for hiring all these new officers who came to us not worrying about where and knowing they would wear a camera, who wanted to do the right thing. Um, but there are, are opportunities uh, every day for someone to do something wrong. And we have to hold ourselves accountable to the same standards that we hold the public to when we choose to take away their freedoms if we're given that job. And for all of those reasons, I believe that it's important that we set expectations and hold our officers accountable to them just as we hold ourselves to those. And so uh, I agree with my good friend, Councilor Fieberborn. Um, this is not necessary. I think it's, we know it's not gonna go anywhere at the legislature. Um, it's a political messaging bill uh, and one that quite frankly hurts us with the Department of Justice. It hurts us in our reform efforts um, to not be united in expecting the very <laughs> things that our cops follow, the basics of human, human dignity, human rights in the Constitution. Um, and I think we can expect that they can do that. They've shown us they can. Uh, and I continue to expect that they will. And so I'll be voting against this resolution. Thank you, Mr. Bless. Councilor Davis. Or, sorry, Councilor Lewis. Mr. President, thank you. Uh, interested in the in the administration to weigh in on this. I mean, with, with Mr. Bachtus here, or or, uh, or with the chief still here. The chief mentioned earlier about what the council can do and and uh, some of the ways that we could support our police officers and help increase our retention. Um, do you support this bill? Do you support our police officers with this bill? Councillor, uh, President Benton, Councillor Lewis, uh, this bill is irrelevant for the city of Albuquerque and the Albuquerque Police Department. Our officers through our collective bargaining agreement are already identified and uh, they have all the protection they need. And I want to make sure all our officers hear that. I think Councillor Sanchez said it earlier and he spoke about the fact that we want our officers to know they're supported. The city of Albuquerque, this administration has worked hard, council and uh, the mayor's office to ensure that they're supported. Last year, when this bill passed, we put out the messaging to calm our officers down and to make sure that no matter what they're involved in, that they're indemnified by the city through the collective bargaining agreement. So we do support our officers. We do indemnify them when they do the right thing. But as we've seen with the latest monitoring reports from the Department of Justice, we also hold our officers accountable when they do wrong. It's a balancing act for the administration, and we'll continue that balancing act, and we'll support our officers when they do the right thing, and we'll hold them accountable when they don't. Chief, you acknowledge that the, your officers were alarmed by this last year, so do you, do you support this memorial or not, just yes or no? Uh, I, I, don't see, I don't see the impact it's going to have on the Albuquerque Police Department in the city of Albuquerque. Does the uh, administration, right now, does the administration uh, support this memorial, yes or no? President Benton and Councillor Lewis, there is no easy answer on this one. There is no yes or no answer. I think there are arguments on both sides, and this is just a memorial. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, we are not going to say yes or no on this one. Uh, you, you have enough uh, discussion already in the council, and then, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to intervene in your discussion, and that's our position. Uh, you, you, got, you all have emphatically supported and, and uh, opposed memorials before. So, um, thank you, Mr. President. I see uh, City Attorney Keith is, has her hand raised then. Well, uh, Councilor Passant has uh, her hand raised as well. Uh, yes, thank you, Councilor Benton. I just want, I wanted to follow up on the Chief's comments. Just to clarify, as we discussed at the last meeting, that where the last time this was up, that the New Mexico Civil Rights Act does not impose the risk of a judgment against an individual officer or, or any individual city employee because it requires the city to indemnify anyone who is subject to a judgment. And as the chief pointed out, the collective bargaining agreement between APOA and APD also requires the city to indemnify officers. Um, so, but so I just wanted to clarify that because I feel much of the discussion is focusing on uh, making sure that officers aren't put at risk of a judgment. And so I wanted to clarify what the statute actually does. 
Professor Bassan. Mr. President, uh, you know, it's funny because just a memorial always comes up when memorials are discussed and it depends on which side you're on with it. But at the same time, I just want to go on the record of saying that I think it's fair to say that we should hold people accountable for, you know, what they do and they should be responsible to do the right thing. Um, I agree with all of that. But I also agree that when we're putting certain people into extreme circumstances and asking them to do what many other people would not want to do in order to protect and serve the majority of everyone else, I think that that calls for a special circumstance. And I think qualified immunity is a big part of that. So I absolutely think that, you know, I've always been in support of APD. Um, I don't think they're the evil demons that some people refer to them as in so many words, but I think that it's something that, you know, when I want to call for help and get assistance or I know people that need it, you know, the challenges are there. And I certainly have said it before and I'll say it again. I don't want to do the job. And I absolutely, you know, appreciate that there's the risk being taken. And I think that that calls for some kind of, you know, extravagant need in some ways as well. So uh, for that reason, I absolutely support qualified immunity coming back. And I'm happy to know that our officers uh, do have some protection. I wish that we could hear the administration say that they support a little bit firmer right now. But at the same time, um, you know, I think that that the majority of this council will hopefully recognize and speak up to the support for APD as well. All right. Any other counselors? Mr. President. Uh, yes, uh, Councilor Sanchez. Um, can we make a motion to suspend the rules and, ex and extend the meeting? Oh, yes, you may, sir. Uh, so moved, is there a second? Second. Uh, there's a motion and a second to suspend. Uh, I think we can get this done in 10 minutes or so, probably 15. Well, I want to say 15 to be safe. Uh, so uh, if that's all right with you, uh, Councilor Sanchez, for your motion. So we'll go to a vote on that. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. And that passes unanimously. All right, we're back with a clock. Um, and further discussion, Councilors. Mr. Sanchez, uh, would you like to close? Thank you, Mr. President. You know. Wait, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry, Councilor Sanchez. I did, Mr. President, I saw Councilor Grout had her hand oh. up before the close, and I just wanted to make sure she might have the opportunity. Okay, to I see. Yeah, let, let's have Councilor Grout speak, uh, uh, okay. Councilor Sanchez, and then we'll have you uh, close. Thank you, Mr. President. You know, today I went to the um, APD graduation and I saw 30 young men and women um, get their badges today and their families, many of, most of them had family members pin those badges on them. And it, it really touched my heart. And I was thinking if that was my child um, going to be um, protecting our city and just knowing what I've learned this year and what what's plaguing our city right now, um, I would want every protection possible to, to know, I'd want everybody to know that my my son or daughter had the, had the backing of who they are um, protecting. Um, and, um, for these reasons, I will always, always support our police. Thank you, Councillor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. As I said before, there is not one person that goes through the vetting to become a police officer who wants to do something wrong or to violate the law. 
over and over and over, we go through the training and it's really hard to pick a regular officer to do the job. You start with sometimes 2000 officers to get one or a class of, of six, oh, 60. And then from there, they filter down. And it's a very, very difficult endeavor. And it takes a long time to get individuals through the process. The training is extensive. The vetting process is extensive. And there is, I guarantee you, not one person is out there trying to do the wrong thing. Now, maybe they get caught up later on. Maybe there's some issues that happen. You know, we're here to help everyone. Anyone that has any issue, police officers are there to help. And I think it's very, very important that we recognize the fact that we have a murder problem in Albuquerque. And we have an officer hiring problem in Albuquerque. And these officers need our support. And for the administration to take a, a, a middle road on this thing is absolutely telling their police officers that they don't support them. And it's extremely sad that we have an administration that doesn't support our officers. And I just hope and urge everyone's support on this bill. And if you support our officers, vote yes. All right, we'll go to a vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Nope. Councilor Davis, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. No, ma'am, no. Thank you. Councilor Feeblecorn. No. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. No. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Benton. No. I pass it on a five to four vote. All right, thank you. Okay, I think we are now on our last item. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. I got us out, off track a little bit there. We're now on item Q. Councilors Pena, Feeblecorn, and Bassan. Legislative budget priorities. Want to tackle at one of you, Feeblecorn? All right, Mr. President, this is R89, establishing legislative and budget priorities for the city of Albuquerque for the first session of the 56th New Mexico State Legislature. I move it to pass. And a second from Councilor Bassan. And uh, again, thanks to uh, three members of, of the uh, of our committee that, that worked uh, so hard on putting these priorities together. Any discussion, counselors, questions? All right, I'll leave it to the counselors to close. Um, I can close if, if no one else wants to. Um, I'll just say, you know, I, um, I'm very proud of this legislation. Um, counselors Bassan and counselors Pena and I worked really hard on it. I think that it the end result is is something that we all agree on that we can really use as a tool to be effective at the state legislature. And I'm I'm very proud of it and urge your support. All right. With that, we'll go to a vote. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Council Fiebercorn. Yes. Council Grout. Yes. Council Jones. Yes. Council Lewis. Yes. Council Pena. Yes. Council Sanchez. Yes. Council Benting. Yes. And that passes unanimously. All right. Thank you, Ms. Hinojos. And that concludes our business. I want to wish everyone a safe and happy holiday season. And uh, we'll see you in the new year, if not sooner. Everyone take care. <laughs>